Good evening, good evening, good evening! Welcome to another episode of What the Hell Am I Gonna Do Wrong This Time? I am Sam, aka Bevitz, and you are tuned in to another episode of Amplify Repair. And uh, fingers crossed, no explosions, fingers crossed, lots of tasty square waves, lots of tasty sine waves. Where the hell are you from and what is your name? Let's have a look in the live chat what we got going on. Yes, the cardio guy, you beat Speaker Freak this time. Holy shit, I did not think that was physically possible. I thought the Speaker Freak had an implant in his brain that rang his head when I was live, the second I was live, and it automatically sent a message on my live stream chat saying hi. But apparently not. Cardio guy, you beat him to it. Congratulations, you win this month's speed, no, this this week's speedy live, live chat guy. So, welcome to the live chat, welcome to the live stream, my man. Chris, how's it going on, my man? Long time no here, not heard from you in a while. I uh, need some advice. John, there's plans have gone out the window. Ah, man, we can still do your plans, just have me on in the background, man. Just have me on in the background. What causes it power-wise to get hot when the amp is turned on? Too damn thin wire. Man, trust me, if your power wires even get the slightest hint of warmth that's a fucking bad day for you that is, <laughs> your wires are terrible if your wires get warm that is not a good day for you that doesn't just mean that they are slightly too thin and there's some voltage that means there is serious voltage drop across your wires to generate that heat in the wire that's that's pretty bad yeah that's pretty bad your wires should never even get a hint of warm at all ever if they do yeah fuck uh, Romania, yes. Uh, <laughs> change current amp. Oh, yeah, I always forget to change the current amp. I can't believe someone actually put on the live chat asking me to change current amp before the stream even started. That is dedication. What even is the current amp? I, I don't even think the current amp is on here. Yeah, there's no current amp actually listed at the moment. Um, if I unhide it, what does it say the current amp is? 
Oh, it's a jail audio from last time. <laughs> Alright, cool. So we're going to put the first time we're going to work on today, which is actually an Infinity Kappa. Um, I think it's Kappa 1. Yes, Infinity Kappa 1 is the first time we're going to work on today. Uh, once I go through some of the live chat. Uh, <laughs> Boston Mass, yo! Uh, good evening, good evening, good evening, all you guys up in the live chat. Should have included 30 seconds into powering up. So, uh, Chris, if your power wires get hot when the amp is idle, that's even worse news. That probably means the amp has a serious fault somewhere. Barbados, fuck, it must be lovely out there. The network guy, how's it going? John Brass, how's it going? The mad scientist, yo, 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 evening, evening. Uh, on a night at Heathrow, damn, airport tings. <laughs> so, uh, who remembers? So, this, this text that I'm flashing right now on the screen. Uh, this is something very funny from my previous live stream that made me laugh, and so that's still there. Uh, it's actually pretty warm in the workshop this evening, so I'm going to take the old hood down. Ah, uh, hi from Australia! Yes, good to hear from you in Australia. That's awesome. Um, I loved it out there. Man, thank you very much for the five pounds, Cardio Guy. Very kind of you, man. Very kind of you. Not actually done anything yet. Holland, Liverpool, man, we've got guys from all over. Okay, so, we're back at the bottom of the live chat now. The amplifier that I'm starting with this evening, I hope that I don't end up finishing on this, because if I finish on this amplifier, it means that we would have been working on it for about three hours, which is not how I plan to spend the whole of this evening. This is an Infinity Kappa 1, and the board looks something like this, and the case looks something like this, although it would have logos on it. Uh, I received this in this condition, as you see here. Uh, so it doesn't actually have its badge or anything like that on it. It is just a plain heatsink, which actually looks pretty cool. And this is a really compact amplifier. It's really quite tiny. It's a really baby, baby little thing. However, now let's take a look at the PCB, because I recognize this PCB from somewhere else. So I'm intrigued, actually, to see um, how much, you know, to see whether anyone else actually recognizes this circuit design. So I'm going to hold it up to the camera here. It's going to be a little hard to make out on the screen, but does anyone recognize this circuit or this style of circuit and tell me what other brand uses this type of circuit? It'd be interesting to see if any of you get it. Just whilst we wait, um, what do you think of subs facing into the cabin versus facing towards the trunk? Um, subs facing into the cabin. Now, this is actually an interesting one, which I will cover in just a minute. Uh, I want to cover that in detail, actually, because it's quite interesting. Uh, Chris says it looks Brazilian. Um, looks like something that you probably don't like, says River Alley. Uh, Cardio guess says Alpine, Lanzar, Alpine or Rockford. Uh, a couple of JBL guesses. So we've got, oh, we've got quite a few guesses. So the Mad Scientist. We've got the Mad Scientist, 13 BTR, uh, Speaker Freak, John Brass, and the Mad Scientist again, all saying JBL. You, my friends, are correct. Well done to you guys. This is actually a, a well, I, I think JBL designed this board. I think this is a JBL board that Infinity have used, paid for, copied, whatever. Um, but yes, this is a, a, a circuit design that is most commonly found in JBL amplifiers. This board design, this actual size of board, I would expect to see in the GTO 350. I think they did a 350. So you've got the great, you've got the GTO, um, you've got the GTO 1401, of course, which is one of my favourite amplifiers. You've also then got the 7001, which is awesome little thing. And then there's a smaller one, which I think is a a 35001. I think it's a it's an even smaller one than the 701. And I think this is the same board that you'd find in that one. But I haven't actually worked on any of those before. Um, so what we have in this circuit. Uh, that makes it that, that make, makes it the same as the JBLs. Um, so first of all, we're going to start right at the beginning with the power supply. So we've got the terminals come in here. Now this this little inductor here is something that all the JBL GTO Ranger amplifiers have. This is literally just a very uh, low value inductor that is uh, on the power wire, on the power lead, on the 12 volts. So that means that basically any noise that the amplifier generates that ends up finding its way onto the 12 volt that would then go back down to the vehicle and cause noise in other systems is filtered out by this inductor, or most of it is filtered out by this inductor. Not 
Actually, most car amplifiers don't have this. This is a really nice addition, and it's a really cool thing that I like about these JBL amplifiers, JBL ball designs, that they, they have this. Next up on the list, we have this driver board here, this power supply driver board, which is exactly the same driver board as used in the um, JBL uh, 14001 and the 12001 and the, four, and the 1004 and the 7001 as well. So this is the same driver board for the power supply that's used in those amplifiers. We then have all the power supply MOSFETs along one side and these are usually 3205s, uh, actually sometimes they're 50 no 6 uh, At the moment we have some random stuff from a previous tech uh, that aren't the, the, the original MOSFETs. We have the power supply MOSFETs along this side. Then we have a transformer, a single transformer, which looks like this, which is the same uh, style of transformer that you find in the JBLs. Then after the transformer, all of the rectifiers and the voltage regulators are then all along this side of the amplifier, which again is exactly the same positioning as the JBL amplifier board. It's the same board, so it's all going to be in the same place. Um, you've got these things. I, can't, I, th I think these might be in this. No, I can't remember what these ones are. Um, I've not actually ever really probed these, so... I, they look like they might be some kind of. Um, they say L. This is ah. This is a, this is an inductor. This is a tiny little inductor. So you know sometimes you see ferrite cores on wires to um, reduce noise. That's actually what what this looks like. It is uh, another core cool thing to prevent noise in amplifiers. So these are, these are you know really clean amplifiers by the looks of it. Then you've got these uh, rail caps, and these are actually a nightmare. If any of these rail caps ever die, they're a nightmare to replace because they're incredibly low profile. They're really, really thin, and that means that when you're trying to find a replacement for them, all the replacements end up being far too tall, and then the cap, the, the board doesn't fit in the case. The, the top doesn't go back on the top of the amplifier. Um, so, fingers crossed, none of these are damaged, um, because that would be a pain in the butt if they are. This one feels a little bit raised, actually. So this one here, these two, they, they push down and they squeegee down, and uh, this one actually feels a little bit raised. So I might be tempted to remove that. Um, and just check its capacitance. Um, now moving on to the output section, uh, the output driver board. This is uh, absolutely a. <clears throat> where are we? Donde estas? Ah, here we go. This is absolutely a JBL style output driver board. We've got an IR. Uh, IR2010S chip here, which is exactly the same as used in the 7001 and 14001. The 14001 uses two of these. Uh, we've got some uh, diodes here, which I think are to do with bootstrap, um, optocoupler, and PWM generation circuit over here. Yeah, this is the exact same kind of stuff as what you find in the JBL amplifiers. And then on the output MOSFETs, we have 50, uh, tw uh, 50N20s. These are yep 50N20P, and these are again the same MOSFETs that you find in the other JBL amplifiers. And then output filtering, we have this great big old school style transformer, um, which is again very common. I think is this an inductor or is this a transformer? I've never removed this one. This is actually called L4, so this is actually going to be an inductor, um, a very good style of inductor, very efficient. Then we have another inductor, we have the safety capacitors, which is the same, we have the relay, and then finally we have the speaker output. So yeah, absolutely JBL for days. And uh, let's uh, have a look on the live chat just quick. Romania, oh, well done everyone that said JBL. <laughs> JBL and Infinity are both owned by Harman. That makes sense. So this isn't a JBL board. Thank you very much to... Um, to uh, the 666 Bud and the Volvo Steph uh, for, for pointing that out. I didn't realize that Infinity was owned by Harman. So that makes sense then. That, so it's, yeah, this is a Harman Kardon board. And I would actually go almost as far to say um, that this board, this style of amplifier circuit, would also be used in many Harman Kardon, JBL, uh, etc. home theatre style subwoofers, obviously with a different power supply section, but I believe that this style of out this output style section um, is actually, before they did car audio, it was probably taken from some of their active subwoofers for, for home theatre and stuff like that. I, I, I bet that that's the case. Okay, so... Uh, I don't actually know what the issue with this one. I think the issue with this one is a um, a driver board issue. So first thing that I'm going to do, as with everything, before I even think about applying some power to it, is I'm going to just make sure that we don't have any dead MOSFETs. Ah, the car audio guy, another two pound from you, my man. Thank you very much, Jacob Realtone in the UK on Sunday. You should come along. I will. No, Sunday. Unfortunately, I'm in Birmingham, so I won't be able to make that. Sorry, buddy. 
So, let's test the continuity on this stuff here. So we don't want to see any continuity between any MOSFETs. So, first of all, we're going to check the power supply, and we can generally get a good idea of the power supply by going across the power supply terminals. We have no continuity, which means that there aren't any shorted power supply FETs. That's to be expected, seeing as this came from a previous tech. And we are also now going to look at the output FETs. We have a couple of them removed here. You can see that um, there's, I think, probably just the blown ones were removed and the others were left in the board to see what was going on. Are any of these shorted? It doesn't look like it. We have, don't have continuity there. And we don't have continuity there. And we don't have continuity there either. Okay. So I'm pretty safe to go ahead and apply some power to this baby and see what the driver board fault that um, we've got in the diagnostic is. Let's get our power wires. Now usually when I apply power to boards at the moment, something to do with the a ground um, weird thing with how my microphones are connected and how my PC sound card is connected um, you, you get like a, a really cool space age kind of sound come through your speakers and come through the live stream when I power these amps up so uh, let me know if you hear anything strange through your speakers when I power this up any weird noises or or sweeps or anything like that sounds always pretty cool to know Yeah. All right, so we're going to give some power to this baby. Now, you can see the scope screen at the top there. We're going to be uh, monitoring that when we check the waves on this amplifier as it powers up. Now, from memory, these amplifiers come on instantly. There's no delay on the remote. When you hit the remote pedal, it comes on, it comes to life instantaneously. So there's no point in me probing the power supply FETs because um, I know that that's probably going to be working fine uh, since this had an output drive circuit issue. So I'm probably I'm going to go ahead and probe the, the low side uh, drain. Uh, the low side drain is the pin two of the low side output FETs, and that should have the nice big rail to rail side, uh, square wave on it. So that's the one that I'm going to be interested in looking at for a drive circuit fault to see how it's going to be acting. So. Uh, let's first of all find which one of these is the low side. The low side is this one. I just tapped my foot on the remote, which gave me like less than a volt on the rails. So I can clearly see on the scope screen there. That one's positive because that's bumping up. Just a, you can see that it's bumping up just a tiny little bit. And then this one is the negative rail, the, the low side. Sorry. So let's put our probe there and see what she does. Okay, looks like that's actually sort of sinking down to ground a little bit there. And the rail, yeah, there's a bit of a short there. The rail doesn't actually climb. Check this out. So if I probe the high voltage rail, we've got 14 volts at the moment. If I try and power up, it draws a lot of current and it doesn't actually build the rail properly. The low voltage rail is the one that appears to have the short on it. Or something that's leaking on the low side rail can you see this because that's the low voltage rail and that sort of tries to build and disappears almost instantly wherever the high voltage rail stays around so whatever is causing the problem is on the low voltage rail I don't I, I wouldn't initially have said that that was a drive circuit issue I wonder whether one of these caps is bad because you know I mentioned earlier how it looked like one of these caps was a little bit bulged this cap feels a bit bulgy on here. So I'm going to actually flip her over. I'm, going, I'm just going to see whether that cap is actually responsible for the low voltage rail, because if it is, I think that might be our problem. It is, you know what? It actually is. That capacitor that I thought was bulging a bit earlier is actually responsible for, um, it's actually filtering the low voltage rail. So I'm actually going to go ahead and remove um, this capacitor for sure. I don't know about, about this one. This this capacitor here. This has got like a an, uh, an, someone else has put like a kind of top on it. Look at this. That feels a bit bulgy as well, you know. I wonder if are they both low voltage rail? 
No, these one, these ones are both low voltage rail. I'm gonna go ahead and remove these caps because I don't trust that. I think that could be that, that. That's the initial my initial thought anyway is that it's the rail caps. Very unusual. Rail caps don't usually die. Only if the outputs die in such a way it causes a flyback effect on the output section, and um, that then raises the rail voltage above where it was ever supposed to be. Hence, it blows the uh, caps. It doesn't usually happen. Very rare to happen. <clears throat> So let's get our soldering iron turned on and let's remove the cap and uh, see if that makes any difference to how the rail voltages build. Uh, going back, so whilst I remove that, I'm going to explain a question that I got earlier. Where was it? Um, about firing your subs forward or back towards the, the front or the back of the car. So, some of you who have experimented with uh, diff oh fuck, that's bright. I've actually got yeah, I've got a nice um, head-mounted torch now, uh, LED torch. So uh, it's, it overexposes the uh, this camera here. But I wonder if I go to uh, if I go to the zoom cam. The zoom cam is pretty good anyway as it is. Uh, but actually, it does it makes a bit of a difference? It's a little overexposed actually. I don't think we need it. We've got quite a lot of light here anyway. It helps out a little bit, actually. It helps out a little bit. Um, but yeah, so firing your um, subwoofers forward or back. So from experimentation, uh, most people will have noticed and found that uh, firing the port to the back, so the ports only, the port is the, the, the important bit here, firing the port to the trunk generally tends to yield the loudest results across a low frequency band. So from 20 hertz up to 35 hertz, Firing the port at the trunk in most vehicles will yield the loudest results. If you flip the box round and you have the port not firing the back, so that you have it up against the near where the reseat re -seat position is, uh, I think that's called the C pillar, um, you'll find that your low frequency bass suffers, but your higher frequency bass is a bit improved. So maybe from 40 hertz upwards or 45 hertz upwards, and this changes depending on the cabin and the size of the vehicle. But having the port in not right at the back of the vehicle, having it somewhere nearer the center, like two thirds of the way uh, along the vehicle, like in the C pillar position or the B pillar position in those cars, um, it can improve your high frequency bass response. So in some cases where people are looking for a dead flat response, uh, I actually think that a good idea is to have the port firing to the trunk and have the woofers firing forwards. And if you've got a low tuned port, what that means is uh, that means that when you are playing low frequencies, your woofer cones are moving the least and your port is doing most of the air displacement. Therefore, the low frequencies, it being at the back of the trunk, is beneficial. However, when you're playing high frequencies, drop my shoulder. However, when you're playing higher frequency bass, and if you're tuned low, then your port isn't really doing as much work. Most of the bass is coming off the cones of the woofers. And so by having the cones of the woofers, then in the C pillar position, a bit further away from the back of the vehicle, that's beneficial for the high frequency. Therefore, it gives you a slight boost with the bass coming off the cones and the higher bass. So I think for the flattish responses that I've ever seen, you've had cones firing forward and port firing back. That's my opinion and take on it. Uh, let me enable the current amp. Uh, oops, why is that so goddamn big? There we go. Current amplifier, Infinity Capital One. That's the current amplifier that we're working on just now, and I shall make that active on all the screens. There we go. Infinity Kappa 1 is the amp of work on at the moment. Do you prefer SPL or THD? Um, well, no one likes THD. THD is something you avoid. <laughs> so, I prefer SPL, I guess. Do you mean do I prefer SPL or SQ? I would say that, for the most part, I prefer SQ, actually, now. Um, yeah, SQ is far more enjoyable to listen to every day. However, I do also love SPL, which is why I have two 15-inch DDZs on the equivalent of about 25k in a massive SIP folder. 
<laughs> so I definitely do like my SPL as well, don't get me wrong. But that's also why my front end stage in my van is tailored for SQ. Sam, I'm considering the Torrents HD 1500. 15,000. Have you seen any problems with the 15k? Yes, massive problems. Um, the Actually, no, actually the 15k seems to be a bit better. Um, the problem you'll find with the tar amps and the Stetson is that they are not designed with um, the European and American style of bass scene in mind. They are designed for the Brazilian style bass scene where you have high inductance woofers, PA style, and the music is generally small, sharp, punchy kicks and higher frequency bass. Um, generally, people that try to run uh, low inductance, low efficiency woofers like Sundown or Ryan HCCA, etc., on Taramps amplifiers and try and play low bass with extended bass notes like decaf, etc., generally they find that their amplifier doesn't last too long. The amplifier just isn't designed to um, be able to output that much power continuously, um, you know, that much reactive. React down at a low reactive load, this is not designed for it. The only Brazilian amplifier that I really really like and highly recommend is the Band of Viking series. Those are designed with the American and European bass scene in mind and they will play their rated power into a low reactive load all day long. Really really nice amplifiers. What frequency do you prefer tuning to? I personally quite like 28 Hz. If you use 28 Hz with a lowish port area, then you get good bandwidth and you still get good lows. Well, actually, okay, so depends what I want really. Generally, for daily listening, 33 Hz with a low low area port is nice because it still lets you drop down to like 25, uh, but it, it also is nice and powerful at 33, and it still plays up to sort of 40, 45, 50 range with the right woofers. Um, so generally 33, but it depends what you want. I also like the 28. Okay, so that's this capacitor removed that I felt was a little bit bulgy. It's not wobbly inside, that's a telltale sign. If the capacitor is a bit wobbly inside, um, that can mean that there has been a problem with the cap. Uh, now I've removed that one capacitor, I'm going to power the amplifier up and see if the rail voltages act any differently. Because if they if they build a lot quicker, and if they maintain their build this time, then I know that that capacitor is bad without even having to test it. So once again, let's go to our scope screen, and I'm going to probe the uh, I'm going to probe the low voltage rail this time, because that was the one that I had small issues with. Okay, still not looking good. So we still have some leakage somewhere. Actually, I'm going to take my thermal imaging camera because whatever is leaking the rail voltage through will be getting pretty hot. So whatever is preventing that from turning on, getting pretty hot to be honest. That's the power supply. That's the power supply drive. And it's building the rail voltage, or trying to at least. So let's go ahead and have a look down our thermal imaging camera and see if there's anything getting hot on the board. Uh, ah, the problem is, is that I've just removed that capacitor, so there's a whole load of heat on the board there, uh, which is actually skewing my results slightly. So I need to wait for that to cool down. While I wait for that to cool down, uh, because there are issues, I'm going to remove the output FETs. There's not many of them here, so it will take like two seconds. Um, and that just means that um, <clears throat> any drive issues that we're looking at uh, will present themselves without blowing the output MOSFETs up, which is useful. So okay. go ahead and remove the output MOSFETs next. Makes it a little bit easier to work on. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Crazy Logics, how's it going, my man? So, did you talk about the subwoofer facing into the cabin or towards the trunk? Yeah, I went into quite a lot of detail about that, actually. Uh, just skip back, I think it was only a couple of minutes ago. Skip back about three or four minutes. Uh, I went into detail about that. 
What's your take on Rockford Fosgate amplifiers? Yeah, I really like Rockford Fosgate amplifiers. They're, they're really, really nice things. Rockford Fosgate have designed it themselves, which I have respect for, rather than just going to a factory and choosing an off-the-shelf circuit design. So respect to Rockford for doing that. And they've actually done a really good job on the design. So yes, I, I do quite enjoy a cheeky Rockford Fosgate. Also love, I love the Rockford Fosgate. Um, I love their their 21 inch woofer. That's a freaking beast. The Rockford Fosgate, they call it the 19 inch, uh, but it's actually a 21 when you compare it to other drivers. Which amps do you prefer, Vibe or Sundown? Uh, uh, some Vibe amplifiers are nice. Uh, Vibe, Vibe did a Class GH bass amplifier, which actually is a really awesome thing. It's really, really nice. It's, it basically works in Class AB mode um, up to a certain power level, and then it switches into a Class D style mode above a certain power level. Uh, and it works really well, it's very clever. So I actually like that amplifier a lot. Um, but build quality and reliability wise, uh, the amplifiers that Sundown use uh, are better, much better. Uh, also, Vibe have brought out some um, Zenon designed full bridge amplifiers, uh, being the M21K and the M14K. These amplifiers are horrendously unreliable. I would not recommend those amplifiers or the Edge versions, which are the exact same thing, or the DS18 versions, which again are the exact same thing. I wouldn't recommend those amplifiers to anyone at this time until they sort out the reliability issues with their board. So at the moment, Vibe, yeah, I'm not doing too well on my, on, on, in my books. <laughs> what would you suggest for a budget grade amp? A good base that would be reliable but inexpensive. Um, I, I don't know, it depends what country you come from. Uh, I can only really give you advice for UK brands since that's the market that I'm in. I have no idea what other brands you might have in different countries that might be better options than things I could suggest over here. All right, that's the output fetch removed. Now I'm gonna power it up again to see if removing the output fetch has changed anything about this, uh, this, this issue we've got where the rails don't like to build. So make sure we don't have any, um, any solder bridges on any of these output fet pads. Looking good. Cool, cool. Okay, let's power it up again, and I'm going to probe the uh, low side. I'm going to probe the low side again, and um, see whether the low rail builds properly this time or not. No, it doesn't. So whatever is causing a uh, issue on the low voltage rail is still present, so um, it might be an issue with the drive circuit. Now, where we've got an issue like this, okay, the amplifier is drawing considerable current to try and build the negative rail voltage, but it's not able to because there is something that is leaking the negative rail through a component. And when it does that, the component that is at fault here will be getting very hot because current is being sunk through it, bringing, draw, dragging the negative rail down. So whatever component is faulty, because it's getting hot, it should be quite easy to see that with the thermal imaging camera. Um, I did remove a capacitor earlier, which caused lots of heat on the board, so it, it, I wasn't able to see small components getting warm. Um, but now that I have removed that, I should be able to see whatever component it is that's getting hot on the scu on the uh, thermal imaging camera here. So we put my, my handheld camera on here and uh, show you what I'm looking at on the thermal imaging camera so you can hopefully see with me which component it is that's getting really hot. So on the screen here at the moment, we're looking at the driver board which has a bunch of heat on it. Um, so it could be something on the driver board. So <clears throat> I'm just going to go ahead and scan over the rest of the board and just make sure nothing else has a, a heat mark on it. Okay, so it's potentially something on the driver board. So let's go ahead and apply the power again and see if any one spot gets really hot on that driver board. Uh, 
Okay, yes. Uh, we actually have the IR2, uh, the IR2010S reaching about 60 degrees. Um, so that then says to me, and that's actually very, a very common component to fail, that is the drive IC. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, make a guess that the drive IC here is the thing that is at fault, or it could be a bootstrap diode around the drive IC. So, no problem at all. Let's go ahead and remove the driver board, and that will allow us to change the IR2010S, and it might resolve the issue. <clears throat> River Alley. Yeah, R River Alley, I've said this already, I've said this a couple of times now. I did talk about the sub facing forward or back. If you scroll back in the video about 10, 10 or 15 minutes now, you should be able to hear what I said about it. I went into quite a lot of detail, so I'm not, uh, not keen on going through it all again. Uh, it was when I was desoldering the um, capacitor, I was talking about that. So if you go back in the video to where I was desoldering the cap, um, I explain that. Your thoughts on speakers firing up and port firing rear. Again, I covered that earlier. If you scroll back in the video, then I explain that. Firing up, firing up is just somewhere in between forward and back. So take on that what you will. Cool, now to remove the driver board from this, it may be a little daunting. Uh, these driver boards can be a pain in the butt to remove. <clears throat> because because they are the dual, um, the, the driver board, the pins are dual layer. So if I zoom in here on the zoom in cam, you can see here that the, these, this, these here are the pins for the driver board. So we've got a set here and a set here. So this here is the driver board. Um, now these pins are very, very tight in the holes. So our normal method where we suck the solder from the holes with our solder sucker doesn't work. And um, using a solder sucker gun also doesn't work because they're just a bit too tight in the holes. There's just not enough room around the via for the solder to flow through and up into the sucker. So the easiest way to remove <coughs> these driver boards is to completely flood those pads with solder and uh, basically wiggle and walk it out one side at a time. So I'm going to go ahead and take my handheld camera and show you that method of removing this driver board here. So we get our soldering iron nice and hot, I've got it set to about 450 degrees Celsius. And on some of these pads there are some ground traces which have high thermal mass. So we need to heat up the ground traces to get some heat into them so they don't soak away all the heat we're applying from our iron to the pins here. And we're going to do the same on the other set of pins over this side. Okay, so now we've got plenty of solder on there and it's nice and warm. We're going to go ahead and from the other side of the board, I'm going to take a grab on either side of the driver board. And I'm just going to apply a little bit of pulling pressure to this side first. I'm going to soak up all these pins again. And I should feel it move. Once all of these pins are, are wet, I should feel it move like a millimetre. Then I'm going to stop and I hold the pressure with my finger. I'm going to keep pulling on it until the solder sets again holding it in its now new position. So that side of the board is a couple of millimeters higher than it was originally. Then I do the same on the other side of the board. I apply pulling pressure from the other side of the driver board and soak up these pins, which will walk the other side of the driver board out by maybe like a millimeter or so. There we go. I actually moved quite a bit more than a millimeter. I'm gonna let that dry and let that uh, set again. And then we'll go back over to the other side and walk this one out a bit further. Now this driver board has been removed before. Uh, you can tell that because there are ver various missing uh, pads on the, uh, on the driver board here. So uh, yeah, this has had a very hot soldering iron on it at some point. Because there's a lack of pads on this one, it makes it difficult to actually melt the solder through the uh, through the via where there's no pad on the back. 
But we're almost there. Almost there. There's like one pin still attached. I can feel it. There we go. Cool, that was a success. There's no pulled vias at all on the driver board. Nice. So, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and remove any solder bridges that are now on these pads. And with the driver board removed, I'm interested to power the board up and see whether yeah, the rail voltages build correctly now that we've removed the driver board. That will absolutely double, 100 million percent double, triple confirm that the issue is in fact on the driver board. Where is my oh, hangers? I'm going to suck the solder from these holes. Now the pins are removed, the uh, solder sucks very easily from these holes. The other side, because we're missing so many pads, and probably actually I'm going to remove the solder from the top side of the board on this one. Yeah, so um, anyone wanting to watch this video later on after the live stream, um, you can find it on my playlist. If you go to my YouTube channel and you go to my playlists, you'll see there's a playlist called Unedited Amplifier Live Streams and um, Amplifier Repair Live Streams. So you'll find this video in that playlist once it's finished processing. It takes a little while to process, so it won't be it won't be instantly as soon as the live stream is over, but it will be a few hours after. Okay, and that's all the solder removed from the holes. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and clean it up a bit. First of all, use my uh, tweezers just to scratch away any flakes of solder that are floating around. Very important to do this all the time after you finish desoldering with a, a solder sucker pump because it likes to dump sol small solder flakes all over the board when you uh, suck. Then we're going to use some uh, isopropyl alcohol spray and a toothbrush just to clean up any solar flux that remains. Where is my stanky toothbrush that I always use? There it is. Yeah, this is a really tiny, really compact amplifier for its power. I really, really love this amplifier. Um, I, I haven't worked on or haven't had experience with the with the Infinity Kappa 
uh, branded one, but I've, I've worked on and used this board uh, in the JBL branded uh, version, and it's really fucking awesome. It's so good. This circuit design is absolutely superb. Hands, um, you know, what's, what's the word? Hands up to, no. What, what do you say? You don't say hands down, hands, no. I, I doff my hat to, to Harman Kahn for this circuit design. There's a saying, but I can't remember what the fuck it is. It's, you say something, don't you? <clears throat> Alright, so let's uh, power this baby up now with the driver board removed and the rails should build instantly because I believe the issue is in the uh, 2010S chip. Let's go to our scope cam and let's check the rails. There we go. Ooh, still draws quite a bit of current though. There's still something that draws current on the board here. Got 2.8 amps you saw there, which isn't actually ideal. Still, there's, there's not there's not that great. There's still something not quite right about this. With the driver board removed, it should just be it should just build the rails like instantly without any problem whatsoever. There's our power supply, which is really struggling. And it's drawing some fucking current. It really is drawing some current. I wonder what the hell is drawing current. Take our thermal imaging camera and have a look. So on the thermal imaging camera, we've got quite a lot of heat on the board still because we desoldered that driver board. Um, but I'm going to be looking elsewhere to see if there's anything else that gets hot. It's still drawing like in excess of 2.5 amps, which it should definitely not be doing at this stage, with the driver board all removed. Okay, power supply effects are getting a little warm, as you can see here on the, on the thermal imager, uh, but I think something smells. I think the, uh, oh, Oh, something over here is fucking real hot. We've got 80, we've got 90 degrees Celsius on something over here. Okay, what is that? I think that's a bootstrap style diode. Oh, hats off, that's the one. Craig, thank you for that. So there, yeah, there's, there's something getting really hot over here now. It's either a capacitor or it's a diode. It's some small thing in that area. My thermal imaging camera isn't high enough resolution to see down that low, which is really annoying. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take you to my zoom in cam so you can see exactly where it is I'm looking at just now. Uh, zoom in is this one. So the part on the uh, on thermal imaging camera that was getting warm was somewhere in this area here. Uh, you can see in this area here we have got a uh, what well, looks like a bootstrap style diode. Uh, this capacitor here, this big fuck of resistor, this capacitor, etc., etc. So I my money is on this diode being bad because that's what it looked like. This heat was coming from, and also I smelt some kind of plasticky burning smell, which I think was probably this um, this glue here getting real hot. Um, so I think that is probably what is maybe shorted in this case. And the driver board might actually be all right um, because this will have dragged that. I mean, I don't know. The 2010s shouldn't have got that hot, so maybe I'll change the 2010s anyway. But I think this might be something to do with it. So let's check continuity over it. So we're going to check, get a diode beep setting. Uh, so one way round, we actually have 342, and the other way round, we have. Climbing, it's climbing and climbing up 600, 700. All right, so it's not a shorted diode. All right, so D35 is not shorted. How about this capacitor next to it? Okay, that's not got a direct short. So whatever it is, I think would I think? Aha! Hang on, oh no, that's meant to be a short because that's in parallel with the gate resistor. That's not the problem. Uh, this voltage regulator here, this isn't shorted out either.
I still think this diode might be bad, you know. I still think this diode might be bad. I'm going to go ahead and put my... I'm going to try and power it on again, but I'm going to put my oscilloscope probe either side of that diode. I'm going to see whether it's dropping voltage across it. So you can see the scope screen there at the top. So if this is negative rail, then I reckon this might be the issue. So it's got positive rail on one side. On the other side, it's got nothing. Okay. And the rail that is struggling... Oh, hang on, there we go. No, we're still drawing current. The issue is improved. It's not drawing... It's the negative... Yeah, it's the negative rail. Negative rail is still sinking down. So you see on the scope screen here, whenever I probe the negative rail, it builds and then it goes, sinks right back down again. Uh, but the positive rail is staying put exactly where it is. So something is pulling the negative rail down, and that's what's preventing it from powering up. Um, and uh, like I said, something was getting real hot on the board earlier. Yep. So I'm actually, I'm kind of actually maybe tempted to just let whatever's getting hot get really, really, really hot so that it smokes and we can see where it comes from. <laughs> Maybe I'll spray some isopropyl alcohol. I'll do, it, I'll do a Lewis Rossman. If I do a Rossman, that means spraying isopropyl alcohol on the board, and then wherever the isopropyl alcohol evaporates from, that's the component that's getting real hot. So let's have a look at that. Let's uh, take you to the zoom-in cam. Uh, I don't know how well you can see the isopropyl here, but I'm going to give it a go. Ah, did I see some smoke coming from around that resistor area? Yep. So the smoke is coming from around this 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 resistor, this ten watt two point two. There is smoke that comes from this leg of the resistor. So if I take my oscilloscope probe, and if I measure on this side of it, first of all, this side of it we appear to have nothing, and on the other side of it we have positive rail. When the positive rail is now the one that sinks down. Oh, this is weird. This has got some fucking weird issues. Now it's the positive rail that's sinking down, not the negative. Negative rail is sinking down, positive rail is now sinking down. Okay. Time to remove the resistor from that, I think. Time to remove that resistor. Yep, I think it's time to remove that resistor. Let's have a look on the underside of the board here. So that resistor pat that resistor location, that is going uh Ah look at that! There's a massive solder blob. There was a so there was a solder bridge. Look at that, look, wait, where, where are we on the on the zoom in cam? Where are we? Where am I? I'm over here, right. Guys, now this isn't something that I made, this was here already. There was a solder, there was this little blob of solder that was going from here to here across these two traces here. And that will definitely have been causing the problem. That's not good. That was already there. I didn't make that one. I wasn't going anywhere near that. So now that I've removed that solder blob, I mean, something might have been damaged as a result of that, which kind of sucks. Um, but let's try and power it on now and see if it comes on and it's more happy. Right, let's grab our, our probe.
Okay, so the amplifier is still drawing, it's drawing much less current now and it actually comes to full, it comes on fully. Okay, we still have something smoking over there. There's still a smoky, smoky Joe. And we've lost the positive rail now. So there's something that's pulling down the positive rail, and I think it might be that diode that got damaged in that. Negative rail is good now. Positive rail is being pulled down, and the amplifier is still drawing 2.3 amps, but it's actually turning on properly now. <clears throat> we have a relay click. Um, but yeah, there's something still definitely getting hot. So I'm actually going to go ahead and probably remove that. I think I'm going to go ahead and remove that diode. Spray some isopropyl on here again. See if we can see which component is uh, is heating up there. Let's give you that view. Oh, can you see that? Did you see that smoke there? Let me do that again. Yeah, see that? Yeah, okay, cool. So I think it's time to remove that epoxy from that area. See what's going on underneath there. There could be a trace that's shorting together or something. Um, so first thing I'm gonna do is remove that diode from that location there and test the diode on my, on my transistor tester, my diode tester, to see if that's all right. Uh, and then I'm gonna go ahead and remove the epoxy from that area and remove that resistor leg and see what the jam is. <clears throat> I don't think there's anything under the board. Let's, let's actually do, a, do one last test from under the board. Let's see whether anything under the board actually smokes up. So it's definitely coming from the top of the board. Nothing on the underside here is uh, smoking like it was on the top just there. It's definitely up here on the top. That's the issue. Okay. Yo, what's up from Dallas, Texas? I was there not uh, I was there last year, last summer in Dallas for Knowledge Fest, which was a fantastic show. This is gonna take a while to remove this diode because uh, one of its uh, pads here is on a very thick trace. Me and Jessie were wondering when we were going to see another vid. I'm sure we'll watch this when she gets home from work. Ah, nice, awesome, man. I'm glad to have you guys back on the stream. might be quicker to remove this one with the iron just because it's got such a high thermal mass pad on this yeah I'm gonna remove this one with the iron because it's gonna take forever otherwise due to the thermal mass on that
Right now, to get rid of this epoxy, I'm going to go ahead and take my hot air gun, heat it all up, and try and scrape it off with my t my flatter head tweezers. Yeah, so that resistor, now that I'm removing the epoxy, that resistor doesn't really look like it's soldering the uh, the hole correctly, which would explain why all this epoxy was getting hot, because there's a high resistance there. Yeah, so if we take a look at uh, take a look at that solder joint there. It doesn't look very good. If you take a, take a look at that, that solder joint there on that resistor, uh, I don't know if it will focus that close. But yeah, that doesn't look that good, so I'm going to go ahead and reflow that solder connection there. It's not snapped. There's no other components underneath it either. Mm. Solder does not want to stick to it. I'm going to try and scrape off. Maybe it's corroded a little bit. I'm going to try and scrape off some of this around the pad. Uh, what might be the best idea is actually just to lift that resistor and uh, clean up the pad and then solder it back, back in again. I'm just going to turn her over. I'm going to remove, just lift this resistor briefly. And then solder it back in once I've cleaned up the pad area. Thanks for the uh, compliment, Andy Jean. I'm glad you got to uh, catch a stream. It's always good fun. I don't know if there's actually any flipping trace here. What's going on here? Solder does not want to stick to this top pad. I don't think there's any trace there. There's, you see, there's, there's a trace here. There's a line that comes off here, and it's meant to go to this pad, but this this pad is not taking any solder at all. Oh, there we go. Maybe it's taking some now. It's got real, real hot. It's yeah. It really does not want to take take solder. So we just want to make sure that that resistor is in fact connected to to that trace properly. Um, and the the the, the, um, the lead for the resistor looks pretty corroded as well. So I'm going to sand that down a bit. Um, it's going to get rid of this the rest of this epoxy around here. So the lead for that resistor looks that looks kind of corroded there. So I'm just going to take some uh, some sandpaper, and I'm just going to go ahead. This is quite hot now, but I just want to try and sand off this lead a bit, so that we go back to the uh, the bare metal, and then the solder should stick to it. the solder from the uh, hole for that pad and re-solder it back down make sure that the connection is nice and strong this time there we go got a nice big hole in that
we go. That looks a lot better already. Let's go ahead and uh, get some fresh sold on that. Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Much better. That's cleaned that up nicely. And it soldered it through to the bottom as well, so I don't even have to do it from the bottom. Uh, it's much nicer. Right, now where's that stanky diode? I think the diode is probably fine, because it wasn't the diode that was getting hot, it was all the crap around it. Um, the diode itself is, is covered in uh, epoxy and all sorts, so I'm just going to try and clean that up a little bit before I solder it back down. just joined why not replace it um, why not replace what the, uh, the the resistor or this diode so the resistor the reason I'm not replacing the resistor is the resistor is perfectly fine it's got a bit of oxidation on the lead um, the resistor doesn't need to be replaced and I don't have a replacement here right this second um, so for purpose of the live stream and also the amplifiers health in general is not going to be a problem having a resistor there the resistor is perfectly fine nothing wrong with it it had a bit of oxidation on the lead and the solder connection to the pad was not good. This diode also, I don't think I have a replacement for this exact diode. One, it's a UD, U1D. I probably do have replacements for that, but um, I think this one's fine. Let's go ahead and take our transistor tester and just double check, confirm that this is okay. So we have the uh, good old MK328. I love this thing. It's fantastic. You can buy these um, all over the place on the internet. However, watch out because a lot of them are not genuine. A lot of them are fakes. You can tell that you've got the correct one because the, the, the legit genuine ones say EZM Electronic Studio along the bottom. And also, when you put your all three test leads together and go into self-test mode, I think it's version 1.12K. But the, the most important thing is that it says EZM Electronic Studio. The fake ones don't say that on them. Yep, that's the kind of values that we're looking for. Yep, that's fine. So that is not a problem. That diode is just fine. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, re refresh, reflow, refresh those solder joints there. And just before actually I put the I put the diode back on, another check to confirm it's okay would be to just power the amplifier up now. Now I've resoldered that uh, resistor down, I'm actually going to go ahead and um, power the amplifier up and just see whether the current draw has disappeared. I have another idea in my head. Um, these power supply fetches that are being used are random. They are 56E12N1. I've never seen these before. I don't know whether these work properly with the amplifier in general, and they were getting hot earlier. I assumed due to current draw on the output section, but they could be because they're not being driven properly and they're not working properly with the, with the board, which would call, cause current draw from the amplifier's power supply. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and fire it up this one more time and see if the current draw on the output section disappears. Let's make sure we don't have any solder bridges from what we just did. Nope, looks good. Yep, looks good. Uh, so let's go ahead and power it up and see what sort of current draw we have now. Uh, oops, my positive power wire has actually come out. Let me go ahead and put that back in.
These leads are getting smaller and smaller because obviously they, they break over time. So I'm gonna, at some point, you just need to solder um, longer leads to these, and lengthen them up again. There we go. Okay. So that's our positive rail, which is staying where it's supposed to be. That's our negative rail, which is also staying where it's supposed to be. Oh, look at that! Yeah, boy! We don't have 2.5 amps of current draw anymore, we only have 0.7, which is actually fucking perfect. That's ideal. I haven't put the diode back in yet. I'm going to put the diode back in and make sure that we still don't have current draw after we put the diode in. If we have current draw with the diode in, then the diode will be leaking, um, which is didn't, didn't actually show it was leaking on the uh, transistor tester. But it'll be an interesting one for you guys to see. If the diode is leaking and it still draws current with the diode back in, um, then that'll be an interesting one. Because that will then show that up as an issue that you should be looking out for. But not, not always if the diode measures fine on the multimeter and not only if the diode measures fine on the transistor tester, is it actually always okay. So because the rail voltages aren't being dropped, aren't being pulled down anymore, we'll probably still have some rail voltage sitting around somewhere. Positive rail, six yeah, six volts positive rail. Short that out. There we go. Yo, Jerry, what's going on, man? Good to see, good to see Jerry on the stream. It doesn't look super pretty, but whatever. It's soldered for the time being. I can pretty it up later if it works. The reason it doesn't look pretty is this is a little bit of excess solder just poking out here. That's, that's fine. And this area doesn't look very pretty because of all the uh, solder flux and because of all the old epoxy. Let's actually clean it up a little bit. Let's clean that area up just a little bit, make it look a bit nicer. This capacitor will get out of the way. never going to look that pretty just because there was all that crappy epoxy and shit over there. So, uh, alright, uh, let's power it up again then and just double, 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 double check that uh, we don't have the current draw back due to that diode being in place. I think I put it in the right ori orientation. I believe I did. Positive rail. Negative rail. There we go, 0.7 amps. So the diode is fine, everything is fine. Everything is absolutely fine now. But we don't know if the driver board's okay. So I'm gonna leave my hot air gun running actually because we might need to remove the, uh, the uh, 2010S. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I, annoyingly, I, need, I really need some um, solder wick, which I ran out of for this because I need to remove the solder from these pins on this driver board now. Um, oh, no, hang on a minute. Looks like there might be some damaged components on here anyway. <clears throat> so just a visual inspection of the driver board here. So this is the... Will my camera focus? I, I usually it can focus in this close. Let's put that there. Let's put this down on the desk. 
Let's try and zoom in a bit further. There we go, that's good. So this here, this is the drive IC for this output section, IR2010S. This is the same drive IC that's used in Banda Viking amplifiers, uh, some Taramps amplifiers, some Stetson amplifiers, uh, and many others as well use this chip to drive the output section. Generally, usually, it's used in full bridge amplifiers, and the JBL, or this Harmon Carden, is no exception. This is, in fact, a full bridge output circuit. Okay, so the 2010S is often used in full bridge applications because it can drive um, a, a full bridge style amplifier here. So, um, what I was looking at there was actually these resistors here. So these are supposed to be, by the looks of it, 10 ohms perhaps. It looks burnt, um, but in certain lights it looks like it says 10R0. So you see this one up here, which looks like it's been replaced before. That actually says 10R0, which is 10 ohms. These ones also, I think, are supposed to be 10 ohms. And these look pretty burnt. And I think these might be something to do with the VCC for this chip. And that would make sense. If the chip is shorted, it's drawing current, therefore, from its VCC, those resistors act a bit like fuses and they might blow. So let's go ahead and check the resistance across these. It should be 10 ohms, if I'm, if I'm right. Uh, that one is actually measuring it down at uh, 5 ohms, or 6 ohms, Hang on, let's have a look what have we got on that. So my test lead resistance is very important, is 0.5 ohms, and across this resistor we have 5.9, therefore we got 5.4, which is a strange resistance to have across that. And across this one we have again 5.4 and it could be actually I think these two resistors might be in parallel so I think these might actually be 10 ohm, resist uh, 10 ohm resistors in parallel so I'm going to go ahead and just see whether they're in parallel or not if they're in parallel these two will be connected which they are they're continuity and the other side do we have continuity uh, yes we have continuity on the other side as well um, interestingly however just looking at this, I don't know whether these are supposed to have continuity. We've got a trace here coming off this top one, but this bottom one, I don't think these two are supposed to be connected together. The fact that we're seeing continuity between these two could mean that there is actually a continuity, a short circuit on the chip somewhere, which is causing continuity between these two points. So let's go ahead and just probe and see where else on this chip does have continuity to that. Any of these legs? No, any of these legs over this side? Uh, okay, yes, we have a leg over this side which has continuity. Uh, there are no other legs that have continuity to that. And how about anything else on the board perhaps? This side of this diode has continuity to the other side of the resistor. This capacitor over here. Aha! Hang on, yeah. Okay. So, what I'm going to do, just to do a little bit of... Um, looking up online, because this is really good to do and it's good to teach uh, what, what's going on here. I'm going to go ahead and actually take a look at the data sheet for the IR2010S and we're going to see what pin 3 is, and pin 3 is the one that has continuity to those resistors that look a bit funky. Okay, um, So let's go ahead and type IR2010S into our search here. <clears throat> Have you benched a Black Death Base 1? Uh, I might have done. I can't remember. I don't recall doing it. Okay, this is what we're looking at here. The SOIC. So, ah! 
Pin 3, as I guessed, is VCC. Now, what did I say earlier about those resistors maybe being on VCC? Because if the chip is shorted, it will be drawing current through VCC. So, I wonder whether that the chip is actually fucked, and therefore we have burnt uh, fusible resistors on the VCC line and elsewhere. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and say, I guess that that chip is probably fucked. So, I'm going to go ahead and remove it now. So, let's take our zoom cam and let's remove the chip and see if that gets rid of I don't think there should be continuity on those um, two resistors I don't I don't think they should be connected I could be wrong it's very hard to see on the trace I could be wrong but I don't think they're meant to have continuity Ah, oh, crazy logic. Congratulations on the Rockford. Those amps can be an absolute headache to fix, so uh, well done on that one. Well done to Crazy Logics on the Rockford repair, man. There we go. Chip is gone. Alright. Uh, now, let's see, with the chip removed, let's see whether there is, in fact, actually still continuity or not um, on those two resistors. Okay, there is still continuity there, so maybe they are in parallel, but it's very, very hard to see. Very hard to see. Other things that are on the board that might be shorted that would cause there to be continuity there where there shouldn't be are capacitors and diodes. Ah, oh, hang on. <laughs> I've got 26 ohms across this cap. Uh, that shouldn't be there. That's not right. I shouldn't have 26 ohms across this cap. Uh, so, this cap might be dead. <laughs> Let's remove that. Because even if the cap isn't dead, um, something else on the board that is in parallel with that cap is dead. Or something else on the board. These caps are very easy to burn, actually. Uh, you can leave burn marks on them, which isn't a problem. Uh, I'm going to try and avoid that. Although I suppose it doesn't really care, seeing as it might be dead anyway. There we go. So let's see, was it the cap that's dead, or was it something else on the board causing our 27 ohms? So let's probe the board. Uh, no more 27 ohms, so if we probe the capacitor now, yep, 25 ohms across the capacitor. So that capacitor is dead, boy! Dead, boy! Bye bye! Bye bye, little capacitor! Cool! Cool! And unfortunately, I think I have a spare driver board for one of these amplifiers. So I think I have a spare capacitor that is exactly the correct one. I'm going to go ahead and take a peek in my driver board box over here, my IC's box, and have a look. There we are. Our balls. This doesn't have it on there. Ah, oh, crap. So it's a slightly different driver board that this one uses. See this? This is the driver board that is used in the 14001 and 7001. This is the driver board used in the Infinity Kappa. So it's the same, however, the 14001 and the 7001 has these capacitors on the main board, not on the driver board. So, in order to find a capacitor then that's correct, I, I don't want to have to order one if I can avoid it because I want to try and get this up and running for you on live stream. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at some donor boards that I have in the workshop. Um, other amplifiers that are not worth repair or too expensive to repair for what they are. And see whether I have a replacement. Now that capacitor value 
if we read it on there, that is, uh, what does that say, 476, 476, 25k, 227. Uh, so, I'm not so good with those readings, I usually have to Google this. I think that would be 25 UF, maybe? 25 NF, maybe? Um, Voltage-wise? Um, I don't know. Not sure. Maybe I could Google that. Um, but anyway. Oh, actually, no, I have a schematic. Ba -ba Boom! I have a schematic, I think, for this amplifier. Uh, yes, I do. I have a schematic. So I can actually see what it is. Amp Doctor was kind enough to include a schematic in this. Uh, let's have a look. Try and get the schematic up. Let's turn my uh, hot air gun off for the time being. Save the heating element. There we go. Uh, so I'm going to give you my head cam now because uh, if I try and open up my computer, it might crash. Uh, so let's have a look. Here we go. So this is what the amplifier looks like normally with all the uh, all the nice casing and stuff on it, um, which I'm assuming is back at the other other workshop. <clears throat> uh, actually, this isn't a schematic. This is just a repair man. Oh no, maybe it is a schematic as well. Here we go. So we've got a parts list. Look at this. We've got a parts list here. Um, so this is kind of annoying. Um, I wonder if I can search for it by text. But the capacitor we're looking for is C. Which way up is that? C ninety three. Um. There we go. So we're looking for C93 on here. Can I do a search? Can I do find in? Uh, oh, no, don't want to send it. Oh, here, here we go. Search button. C93. Oh, here we go. C93 and C94, that's that's exactly what we want. So, C93 and C94, two. These are surface mount capacitor. This is the code for them. And they are a 47 UF. Is that what I said? No, I didn't say that, did I? What did, what did I say it was? I said, I said it was a 25 or something. So it's a 47 uh, microfarad. I, I, I get told off for saying UF, sorry. It's a 47 microfarad, um, and it's a 25 volt case D. So 24 microfarad, uh, sorry, tw a 47 microfarad and 25 volts. And if we just take a look at the markings on here, so the markings that we had were... Um, uh, oh, wow, you can see my, uh, my phone screen nicely and uh, zoom in there. Uh, but yeah, the markings that we had, so just to kind of get the markings done correctly so it's 47 microfarad so four well my nails are disgusting from the workshop apologies uh, 47 that's 47 microfarads so the six will be the number of zeros uh, referencing to I don't know picofarads nanofarads so yeah 47 six that's 47 microfarads and the voltage it's uh, what was it uh, what was the voltage on it again it was a 25 volt. Um, so I don't know where the 25 volt bit of that is. It's got 227. Ah, 25. Here we go. 25K. So, yeah, it's, it's 47, 47 microfarads. The 6 is just the number of zeros after the, the, the farad thing. And then we have 25 volts. And the 227 is something to do with the manufacturing batch date, etc. Probably. <laughs> okay. So time to now scavenge some donor boards and see if I have a capacitor that is that spec. I really hope I do. I, I feel like I've seen them around. 
Um, I feel like I've seen them around, so I think I probably will have somewhere. Let's check the other IC chips I've got in here. Might be one on one of these other boards. Aha! Ah, no, guys, I found what it is. <laughs> I found out the uh, what it was. So look at this, right? So you remember how I compared these two driver boards with each other? Um, actually, this is too, too zoomed in. Let me take my head cam. Yeah, so I, I mentioned before how this is the driver board from this Infinity, and this is the driver board that's used in the uh, JBL versions of, of this amplifier style design. So on the back of this, we have a couple of things. On the back of this, we also have a couple of things. And on the back of this one, we have four capacitors. And on the back of this one, we have two capacitors. So the capacitors that are here on this board are actually flipped around and on the back of the JBL board. So I should be able to steal the ones from the back here. I think these are going to be 476-60-E11. Yeah, these are going to be fine. So there's a couple of capacitors on the back of this one here, and these are, I think, slightly different specification, um, but they are the same Farad rating. You see these ones? So these are 476E60E11. E so I think this is going to be a 60 volt version of the capacitor, but that's fine. Having a higher voltage capacitor in place is actually not a problem whatsoever. It's absolutely fine. Um, you don't want to go lower on the voltage of the capacitor, but higher is fine. So what I'm actually going to do... Actually, they look exactly the same. I think I think that's going to be fine. Look, they're, they're the same. I reckon they're the same thing. I reckon they're the same thing. Just to confirm though, I'm actually going to Google the spec, the, uh, the, the numbers on this uh, on this other cap on the JBL. Uh, four seven six e sixty e eleven. Uh, that's not going to come up with a capacitor, is it? Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, look, look th th this code here generally brings up 25 volt DC capacitors. Yeah, that's going to be absolutely fine. Cool, cool, cool. Happy days. I'm actually going to replace both of those capacitors on the uh, Infinity board. <laughs> because the reason I'm going to do that is because if one of them got hit, both of them might have been stressed. So it's a good practice, you know, why not? And then the only other thing I need is a couple of 10 ohm resistors to go in the VCC line of that. Um, a couple of 10 ohm resistors to go on the VCC line for the chip. And then I need another 2010S. And I actually have a whole drawer for the 2010S, but I don't, I've got a drawer of ones that I put aside because I, but they're so, I can't remember if they work or not. So it might be a case of fitting some 2010S chips and um, seeing if they work or not uh, before soldering it in fully. Uh, I'm actually going to test this capacity. You know, you know I removed this capacitor at the start um, because it felt a bit bulgy. I'm actually just going to go ahead and test that now. Uh, because these are big capacitors, I'm going to short out the capacitor first with my tweezers before putting it into the into the tester. That's important because you can kill the tester if you don't. Yeah, 
it might take a little while to test this cap because it's pretty big. It's telling me that we have about 3,000 microfarads, which is 300 off, but that's, you know, that's fine, that's room for error. 3,000 microfarads on this, and we got an ESR of 0 ohms. That's important. If there was an ESR of anything higher than that, then that could be a problem. So, yeah, that's probably fine. It has enough capacitance in it anyway. <coughs> and it's not wobbling around. Oh, no, it is a little bit. Oh, no. Okay, no, this isn't good. I didn't do it hard enough before. Right, if you get a capacitor and you shake it, if it wobbles inside, it's no good. I can feel that wobbling, so that needs to go. I'm actually tempted to replace this other capacitor as well, which feels a little bit bulged. But, like I said at the start of this live stream, if you weren't with me, these, oh, that was a good catch. These capacitors are a freaking nightmare to replace because they don't make them, they don't seem to make them in this in this uh, low profile design anymore. So you can't get caps that fit this fucking board anymore. Ugh. Super annoying. What I did last time is I actually um, rather, so this board has four capacitors on it, right? What I did last time with one of these that had bad caps is I actually replaced all four that were 3300 microfarad, I replaced them with two single capacitors that were 6800 microfarad. Uh, and they, they lay sideways, they lay down on the board, right? And that worked fine, but they were just a little bit too tall still. The, the, their, 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 their thickness, their diameter, was still just a bit too much that it meant that I couldn't put the case back on flat on the top of the amplifier. Mm. So I wonder what I'm going to do in that kit. I wonder what I'm going to do there. I mean, this does still show that it has, like, enough capacitance in it, but it's it's wobbling, so that's not good. All right, let's remove these caps then. Let's remove these little baby ones. These actually take a little while to remove because the edge of the capacitor is so sharp here um, that it actually causes eddy currents with the airflow from the hot air gun. And it means that it doesn't actually, the heat doesn't really get to the pad very easily. You have to keep going backwards and forwards like this um, because if you just sort of heat it like this from the top, it's not actually heating the pad really very well. You have to actually properly angle it at the pad. Guys, tell me, what sorts of videos would you like to see from me next? Like actual videos, not, not live streams, like audio style videos. <laughs> ah, fuck. Actually, guys, can anyone tell me? Fuck. Can anyone actually tell me which way up was the capacitor on here? Can so I can't do it. Can somebody scroll back in the video, or if they remember? What's the capacitor this way up? Because I think these, I think these might be polarized. Because it's got a line on it, I think these are polarized caps. Was it this way up? Or, actually no, I can tell. Here we go. No, 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 the markings tell me. That's fine. It's fine. Panic avoided. 
You see we've got a little chamfer on the edge of this marking here, on this one that's still on the board. That's where the line is. So the chamfer is where the line is and the back is the sharp edge. That's fine. I was a bit worried then that I had uh, not taken into consideration which, which way around these went. Tyler is saying to never reuse uh, these tantalum capacitors uh, and heat kills them easily. Uh, no worries, well what we'll do is we'll see whether these have died uh, as a result of my soldering or whatever or the, uh, the hot air gun. I have replaced these capacitors before in the past and had no issues. Um, so fingers crossed we're working with delicate components but at, the, at this point in time for this live stream purpose I don't have a choice. So I don't have any new ones of these. So if you want me to continue with this repair, we'll use these ones. And uh, I think they'll be all right. Because I've done this before with these types of capacitor and haven't had any problems. Okie dokie, maybe that's cool down. And uh, actually whilst the board is warm, I'm gonna remove these uh, resistors here, which I believe to be 10 R zeros. And I can actually check that on the capacitor. Oh, on the capacitor? I can check that on the schematic. Uh, these ones are gonna be, uh, these ones are, see, that's the thing, I, yeah. I, think, there, I think there is a, it's hard to tell. I, I can't really tell whether there's a trace in between those pads um, because the board is so well masked. See this this pad of the uh, of R what looks like R one hundred and sixteen doesn't seem to go anywhere. Um, there's, there doesn't seem to be a a trace coming off it this way or downwards. So the only trace that's coming off it must be going upwards. So it must be in parallel with this one. So that's R116 and R19. Is that 98 or 96? I think it's 98. Let's bring up the uh, the uh, data sheet again. So this time we're looking for R116. Ah, uh, no, hang on. R116 is showing a 680R. That's definitely not a 680R. Although, it, R11, R199. R198. See on, on this, here on this schematic, it's showing R116 being in parallel with R199, and uh, they're both 180s, which does kind of marry up with what we're seeing here. 
But R117 and R193 measure uh, the, these ones on here. R1, 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 no, R117, these are actually 10, 10 ohms and they're in parallel. See that? So what are those ones on this board? Yo, Seth, man, how's it going? Good to see you, bud. Not seen you in a while here. So these are also 10 ohms. So there was a 10 ohm resistors in 117, 193, 196, and 116. And according to this schematic, in 116 and 199, there should be a 680, but it doesn't tell me what should be in 198. R198, let's see. I don't know why my phone's doing this. It's like a. R117, R193, look at this, R117, R193, R198, R118. They should all be SMD 10 ohms. So why do we have a difference? Why does it state something different on the flipping... Oh, what the fuck, I don't care. All right, let's put 10 ohms in there. That's what it's saying to do on this uh, sheet here, so let's put 10 ohms in there. Because we had 10 ohms in there before anyway. Compare resistors to your donor JBL drive board. That's a good idea. Good idea, my man. Very good idea to evolve a Steph. Compare the resistances to this one. So the resistors were on VCC, which is pin number three of the 2010S, which is over here. So if I go ahead and probe VCC, and uh, let's have a look. Yeah, they're 10 ohms, so that's fine. They, these are going to be 10 ohms. Thank you very much, Robert Steph, for confirming that. We're going to drop some 10 ohms in there. This is the wrong solar tip for this job, really, but oh well. Can't bother to change the tips just now. Whoops. Don't got blown away, y'all. There we go. Alright, uh, so the only thing left now that we want is a new IR2010S chip which I have a drawer full of here, there's some in here. Like I said, I can't, I don't know which ones of these work and which ones don't, if any do, if any don't. I cannot remember. I think this one works. This one uh, has actually been scratched off. Uh, this one came out of a, uh, a Taramps, uh, which I, I believed had bad drive ICs, but it didn't, it made no difference. So I think that one's probably gonna be all right. 
so I, probably, I think I'm going to go ahead and fit that because I think that one's going to be all good to go. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to freshen up the solder pads. Hello, me is curious, did you ever work on a tube amp? Nah, nah, never worked on a tube amp before, ever. I've only ever, I've only really been working on car amplifiers. And there are few and far between car amplifiers that use tubes. There is one that I can think of which is freaking amazing. But no, I've never worked on that. Drop this driver board on. Uh, sorry, let's drop this drive IC on. I do believe it goes this way up. Yeah, BCC is pin three, so it goes this way up. Have you worked on a class T amp? Strictly amps? Yes, I've worked on a um, a Phoenix Gold uh, tantrum. Tripath, uh, it was a tantrum 1200 watt thing. I actually failed to repair that. Um, there was nothing wrong with the uh, Class T uh, chip. There was something wrong with the power being fed to the chip, to the actual module. Uh, I have two of the uh, Tripath modules here in the workshop, just spare, um, because I gave up on that amplifier quite a long time ago. So I haven't personally had any success with the Class T. Not because it's a class T, but just because of the circuit uh, as, as a whole. I, I struggled with, they had some fucking crazy issues. We even tried to repair it on live stream together and uh, we actually went backwards. We actually made it worse. I had some good knowledgeable guys like uh, H1 Nicholas with me on the stream at the time, trying to work out what the issue was with it. Uh, but no matter what we tried, it just got worse, so I don't know. There we go, I think that's all the uh, pins connected there. I'm going to drop a little bit of extra solder on this uh, this big thick trace here, because uh, sometimes when you use the hot gun that doesn't really solder properly with that big thick trace at the bottom. There we go. And I'm going to do the tweezer wobble test. Any of these pins that aren't soldered properly will wobble off the uh, off their pads. So um, this is very hot. I'm just going to take something to grip that with. We're all good, that soldered real nice. Okay, let's turn off the hot air gun. I'm gonna uh, isopropyl this up, give it a quick clean, just for good measure. Okay, 
So we're now ready to fit this back into the uh, the board, uh, but the um, the legs there, they've got loads of excess solder on them, and uh, what I want to do is uh, obviously slide the board back into the main board nicely and then solder it in, and I can't do that at the moment uh, because there's too much excess solder. Now, I would usually use my solder wick in this scenario, however, I appear to have run out of solder wick. Um, I've got some really crappy stuff that doesn't fucking work. It doesn't have any flux in it. So for this stuff to work, I'd need to use some flux. Actually, which I do have. I do have some flux, but this is terrible, terrible flux. It actually goes conductive. Uh, however, because these are just pads, I can allow it to go conductive. Uh, because these are just pins, I can allow it to go conductive and then clean it off after. Oh wow, that spits like crazy. That spits like freaking crazy. It does work though. It does does do the job. Spits like a bad bitch. That does seem to have done the trick though. This this solder flux, I didn't have any luck with it before. Uh, sorry, this uh, this solder wick, I didn't have any luck with before, but I wasn't using it with solder flux. So now I've used it with some solder flux, it actually appears to be doing an okay job. Yeah, looks like we've removed most of the solder from those pins. Uh, so because this solder flux is terrible, and it's actually conductive when it gets hot, which is not what you want from solder flux, I have to properly, properly, properly clean it all off now. Get rid of all that jazz. So there isn't any remaining. No one likes a spitter, Seth. You're absolutely right. Absolutely no one likes that. No one likes that shit. How we're looking? Are we good? Have we removed all that janky stuff? I think so. Was last spray for good good measure. All right, I think we're good to go into the board. I think we're good. Now, something that I'm going to do, because we don't have any output FETs in the board yet, uh, something that we can actually get away with doing is actually just plonking the driver board into the, the holes like this. And, uh, oh, there's some, some of that solder flux on the back of this board somehow. This stuff gets everywhere. Damn. They just hate it when it gets everywhere.
So on the optocoupler. Okay, I think we got rid of the most of it, which is good. This uh, this solar flux gives me anxiety because it goes conductive. <laughs> so if there's any remnants of it anywhere on the board, it can really screw things up. Okay, I think we're good. Anyway, what I was saying was, we can actually uh, put this into the board like so, and actually hold it at an angle. Like put pressure on it to connect up, hopefully, all of the pins to their desired traces. And um, with them being connected to the desired traces, hopefully, we can see whether the drive IC is actually going to work or not. Uh, if the drive IC is bad or shorted, then we will see voltage where we shouldn't see it on the MOSFET pads. Um, if it works, then we won't see that, and happy days. Uh, but this, this driver board uses a lot of pins, so I don't know if we will be able to... Um, don't know if we'll be able to make a connection on all of the pins, but just by pushing it. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because soldering this driver board in and out actually is a bit of a pain in the ass. And having to do that thing on the on the sol on the legs every time with the solder flux, so I want to try and avoid soldering it as much as I can in and out of the board. So if I can just put pressure on it and get all the pins to connect, then I test it that way. That would be ideal. Um, so that's why I'm doing this and not just soldering it straight back in straight away. Because uh, yeah, I want to try and see whether whether it's going to work without having to solder it in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and probe one of the low side gate pads um, and actually in order to do that I want to I want to leave my um, I want to leave my probe in there so I'm going to just suck the hole from it suck the solder from the hole slightly so I can leave my probe in the board and use both hands to myself there we go so I want to put the probe in the low side gate there. Uh oh, there's solar flux on the table, which probably means there's some on the bottom here. Ah, oh, this stuff gets fracking everywhere. I don't want any of the on the bottom of this board, because like I said. For some reason, the solder flux I've got is conductive. No, I think we're good. Right, okay. And anyway, like I was saying, probe in there like that. I'm going to put apply pressure to the driver board and uh, get it to power up. Hopefully we should see the waves that we're looking for on the scope screen or we should see the voltages in the correct places where we should on the scope screen So let's have a look. Let's see what we got All right, so I just gave it a little quick pulse of juice there and we have Negative voltage on the low side gate. That's correct We don't have anything on the low side drain, which is also good And on the high side
on the higher side we have the voltage where it's supposed to be as well so that's a positive thing cool so I'm gonna go ahead now and uh, give it full full voltage power it up fully and uh, yeah see what see what happens Find, so find someone to push, it isn't going to... Okay, so it goes full It goes full DC, but I've got a feeling that's what these amps do when they power up. It also could be because the pins aren't all connected properly. So it turns the FETs on fully and then turns them off again. I think that's what these amps do without any FETs in. I've got a feeling that that's what they do. A way to confirm and double check that is to actually run some signal into this amplifier uh, and see whether we have a square wave on that low side drain. And I'm just going to go ahead and uh, find my RCAs that come from my PC and plug these into the amplifier. Like this. Plug my RCAs in. I'm going to open up Audacity with a 40 hertz test tone. And generate tone 40 hertz. Yep. Okay, so we're going to generate a 40 hertz test tone. And I should see, if this is working correctly, this chip, I should see a 40 hertz square wave on that low side gate when I when I power her up. Alright. So let's see. I'm gonna press play on my on my uh, 40 hertz and turn the gain right down. I think this is down anyway. I got the gain, level, boost, high pass, low pass level input. Okay, so the gain's right down, but I should see a little square wave appear on this low side, provided this works. Let's see. Hmm, there isn't actually a, a square wave there. That's, uh, that's worrying and annoying. Ah, hang on, no, my computer's muted. <laughs> I actually have my speakers on my computer muted. That's probably gonna not be why there wasn't a square wave there. Let's try it again with the uh, sound not muted this time. Mm, nope, still not a square wave, okay. Let's see whether we, we have actually got signal coming in here. Yep, there is signal coming in there, you can see it, just about. Uh, okay, let's check the, uh, I didn't actually pay attention to the current draw. Let's have a look at the current draw. Current draw is still 0.7. All right. What I'm going to do now, next, what I'm going to do next, is I'm going to actually fit some sacrificial MOSFETs to this amplifier. Um, I'm going to fit some um, really old, crappy uh, 640N MOSFETs to the board. And if the amplifier is going to work, um, I will see a little bit of switching on those FETs if the amplifier is not going to work and if there's actually a problem with the chip then uh, those FETs will probably explode. But I still I still wonder whether this is because I, I haven't got the driver board soldered in properly but I don't if, if this if this chip's gonna be dead I don't want to fucking keep desoldering it all the time because this board is a nightmare to desolder. It sure as hell looks like I'm making a connection on all the pins there. Try one more time with the signal. I've definitely got the volume up, yep. Definitely plugged into RCA input. Definitely got definitely got signal coming in. It looks like it's, it's going to turn the FETs on, like instantly. Um, but I've got a feeling that's what these amps do without any FETs in the board. 
I, I remember that from last time. So I'm going to go ahead and just just test it with some vets. See what they do. See what happens. If they explode, they explode. No big deal. Because these these vets are very sacrificial. They're old 640Ns that work, but I don't have any matching batches for them and whatever. So. <coughs> Hello to JC Extreme Audio, what's up my man? Thanks for joining the stream. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and solder some uh, 640Ns, which aren't the correct MOSFET for this amplifier, of course. Um, but they are very sacrificial, I don't care if they die. Um, again, like I said, I'm not going to solder the driver board in. I'm going to push very hard on the driver board <laughs> and uh, see what happens. Have you had much success with a Weller desolder station? I haven't really tried one, um, but I have tried de some desolder stations before um, and haven't had much success. I have much more success just with the uh, regular old, uh, regular old handheld pump. Good old trusty. Now then, in order for this amplifier to work properly, we need to put MOSFETs in pads that are in parallel with each other so uh, sorry in, yeah we need to put a MOSFET in each bank so to find out which bank what banks we have we need to see how many of these are in parallel with each other so we've got these two in parallel with each other this is in parallel with each other it looks like we have three MOSFETs so we can put one per bank so we should have one high one low by the looks of it so I should be able to just put one MOSFET in here The other MOSFET I should just be able to put into the low side. One MOSFET in high, one MOSFET in low. That's all we need to make a switchy switch on the outputs. Okay, so maybe explode. It might have explosion coming soon to a channel near you. Okay, let's see if this is. <laughs> oh, this is definitely not what you should be doing. <laughs> I highly do not recommend this. <laughs> uh, the things we do for convenience, eh? Okay. Let's probe the low side, uh, low side drain. You should see a square wave there if this all goes well. Uh, change my scope settings real quick. Okay, you ready? Three, two, one. Yeah, we have a square wave. I'm not, that is fucking awesome. Fucking happy days. Booyah. Now, you only saw a square wave for a split second then, and there's a very good reason for that. Um, because these MOSFETs are not the MOSFETs designed for this amplifier, they are 640Ns, and there's only two of them rather than six, um, running this amplifier with 
these amp these MOSFETs in the board for too long might actually cause a failure because the output section isn't balanced properly with the gate resistances and the gate capacitance and things like that. I just wanted to see a square wave there. It didn't matter how long it was for. That then by seeing a square wave there, I know that the drive IC is working correctly, which means that I can now safely solder the driver board back in place to the board um, and know that everything on there is probably working fine. Because what I didn't want to have to keep doing is desoldering the driver board every five minutes to change the drive IC if it was bad. So that is a good sign. That means that uh, the driver board is probably working just fine. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and solder the driver board in properly now and then I'm going to fit, we've got some brand new 50N20P MOSFETs here which are the correct ones. I only have four, I'm supposed to have six. Okay, well I'm going to go ahead and fit some of these anyway and uh, actually there were some that came on the board um, and I don't know, I don't think they were dead. Where did I actually put those? Oh, they're here. So there were four that came with the board, and uh, I'm hoping these are going to be a similar enough batch to use with this new four. So I can use three from the old ones and three from the new ones. Fingers crossed, that's okay. And then I'm going to have to try and source a new capacitor from somewhere, or a new couple of capacitors from somewhere, because I don't... These ones are, are wobbling inside, and that's not good. If you take a brand new capacitor, a large one like that, let's just have a look. Uh, I think I've got some caps over here that, that are okay. So this, this capacitor is fine, this capacitor isn't damaged, it's just got broken legs. It shouldn't wobble like that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't hear, you shouldn't be able to feel any movement inside the capacitor when you do this. If you can feel movement inside the capacitor when you do this, it means it's fucked. It means it's fucked. Which it is, it is doing, it's wobbling around in there, so no good whatsoever. So we're going to have to try and source some replacement caps for that, but that's not essential to get the amplifier up and running. Um, it's not essential to get the amplifier up and running just at this, at this point in time, so... <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go ahead and remove this other cap that looks dented as well. Alright then. First things first. Let's remove the other capacitor that looks bulged, because that one is probably bad as well. Then solder in the driver board. Actually no, let's solder the driver board in first before it falls out. <laughs> I ain't having it. I ain't having it. <laughs> Uh, who recognizes that? <laughs> I'm thankful for thankful for your vids. Oh, I'm thankful for your views, Mr. Uh, M Bell. Thank you very much. Hello, hello, hello. I've got a few precision power atom line of amplifiers. Have you worked on one? I have not worked on the precision power atom. We don't really get much precision power over here in the UK. Um, there's very small stuff, PPI stuff floating around precision power. Yeah, repair the Q repair the QSC knowledge is always worth your time repairing. You'll have more knowledge. Taco Tuesday was great. Ah, oh, it's Tuesday today. I did not have Taco Tuesday. I've got a free free QSC amp uh, power amplifier with a dead channel. Should I repair it? Uh, I have some knowledge, but is it worth my time? Yeah, man, absolutely. Because the repair of the amplifier will teach you a lot more knowledge, which is invaluable. So, uh, yeah, give it a go, man. If if you have the spare time and the resources and the equipment to give it a go, then yeah man, fucking, of course, give it a go. Por que no? Uh, do I give you the handheld cam or do I give you the, the zoom in cam? I think I'm going to give you the handheld. And this is why I'm going to use the fume extractor on my soldering line because uh, there will be a lot of uh, solder flux fumes coming my way shortly.
Love your videos, learning so much. Thank you, uh, Teresa Wolf. I'm glad you're learning some stuff. That's uh, what these videos are for. Now, because these solder pads on the back here uh, aren't the best, as you can see, they, uh, they, they've been heated up previously by an iron that was too hot, and so they are no more. Um, what I'm having to do is the pins that are poking through and don't have any pads on the bottom, they'll have traces that are connected to the top of the board. So it's very important when you're soldering the driver board back in to leave your iron on the pin for a long time and keep applying solder so that it flows through up the pin to the trace on the top of the board very important because if it doesn't connect to the trace on the top of the board then you're going to have a problem uh, the amplifier is not going to work properly and it could blow again a good way to check whether you've got a connection to the top trace is to give the driver board a wiggle and if the leg that you've just tried to solder moves then it's probably not connected very well to the top of the board so give it another solder, hit it again with the iron and uh, yeah it should be good. I'm also just, uh, when I'm soldering these in, these uh, pins that don't have any pads on the bottom, as I'm applying the solder, I'm gently wiggling the pin in the hole uh, to allow solder to flow through to the top either side. All right, okay, cool, I think we're good. We don't have any wobbly pins. No, that's all soldered in like a boss. <laughs> that is soldered in like a boss. Awesome. Uh, oops, I told my, turned my soldering on off. We don't need to do that. We want to remove the other capacitor that looked a bit bulged because that wasn't, uh, that's not going to be good. And uh, now, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of thermal mass here. Um, so what we need to do is turn our soldering on up a little bit try and get it off quicker um, so because there's so much thermal mass here the only way that this capacitor is going to come free easily is if this whole trace this whole rail voltage trace is nice and hot so what I want to do is just leave my soldering iron on there for like a minute or so and um, wait for that that trace to heat up properly and then the capacitor will fall out much easier I can walk it out much easier How did you know what type of FET can be used to test the board? Um, so the voltage rating was the main thing that I knew would be fine. So obviously the correct FETs for the amplifier need to not only be the correct voltage, but they also need to be the correct current rating, the correct uh, amperage rating, so the amplifier can do rated power without blowing the FETs. 
Um, but in order for, for a quick test with no speaker load connected, it doesn't really matter what current rating the FETs in the output section are because there's no current being drawn from them. So they can be like a tenth of the actual FET, the actual design FET current rating, and they'll still run. You know, the amplifier will still turn on and idle. Um, it just obviously won't make, make, make rated power, the FETs will just explode too soon. So the uh, 640Ns, they are 200 volt FET parts, and this amplifier uses 20N50Ps, which are 200 volt 50 amp. The, the original ones that this amplifier uses are 50 amp FETs. Now the 640Ns are a, a, they're only like something like 16 amps or something, they're like really low current FETs. So obviously, the 640Ns aren't ideal for this amplifier to actually run, but for a test, they are high enough voltage. Now, the reason I said I didn't want to run the amplifier too long with the 640Ns in the board was because the 640Ns have such a low current drain, uh, current handling on them, their specifications, like their gate capacitance, um, are going to be different to the actual design FETs. And because I was only running one 640N, that's even worse, so the gate capacitance was even lower. As a result of that, the drive circuit for the output section was designed to deal with gate capacitance levels of six of the original FETs. And by only running two 640Ns, the gate capacitance was seriously lower, considerably lower than designed, uh, which could, can cause the amplifier to fail. That's why I didn't want to run it for too long. Ah, this, this capacitor is super, super wobbly inside. I wish, I wish you could feel this. So both these capacitors that felt bulged are definitely, definitely toast. That's wobbling around in there. It's like a ding -ling 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 -ling. It's like a bell inside or something. I wonder if, I wonder if you can hear this. So this is a bad cap. Can you hear that with your headphones on? This is a good cap. This is a good cap. See, nothing. There's, there's nothing wobbling inside. But this bad one... Yeah, you can definitely hear that, right? I, I have to listen to that back after the live stream. So that is a massive pain in the asshole. Because, like I said earlier, you can't really get these caps. But until then, let's put the original MOSFETs back in the board and let's see this baby fire up properly. So let's remove the 640Ns that we put in as uh, testers. So look on the live chat. Ah, 13 BTRX3, man, 20 bucks. Very, very generous, man. Thank you very much for the donation, man. Uh, as always, if you've got any questions or anything, give me a shout. I'm more than happy to help. But yeah, massively appreciate the, uh, the the donation there, man. Thank you very much. Very generous. I just realized bad cap, good cap is like, um, it's like bad cop, like, it's like saying good cop, bad cop in an accent, but I don't know where the accent's from. Good cap, bad cap. That's not the right accent, is it? I don't, I don't know what sort of accent would replace an O with an A. Good cap. I suppose, actually, American, like super over exaggerated American might work. Good cap, bad cap. Kind of sounds a bit like cap. Super exaggerated British accent doesn't work because then, then, then you, you just get good. You get good cap, bad cap. I can't even do I can't do an Australian accent at all. I can't even try. I can't I can't even do an attempt at one, so I'm not even gonna bother trying to do that. Um. Oh 
I don't I don't know if I don't know if I can do an African accent. I don't think that would be politically correct. Political correctness doesn't solve anything, it just takes away our speech. Yeah, 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 for sure, but I don't want to offend anyone by doing an uh, African accent. <laughs> Okay, that's all the souls holes souls sucked? What am I turning into a dementor or something? The holes have been sucked, not the souls. <laughs> Truly people in here, yo! Uh, my actually one of my best friends, uh, sisters is uh, just recently got married to a Truly guy and man, he's one of the the chillest, funniest guys, man, he's fucking awesome. Yeah, and his family pretty jokes as well. Uh, yeah, tr Truly people seem pretty jokes, pretty chilled out. Uh, actually, uh, my friend's sister actually complains sometimes that he's a bit too chilled out and he's not serious enough. He's just like, yeah, whatever, man. <laughs> Right now, so because I don't have enough um, brand new MOSFETs to fit this amplifier up, and these ones actually came from the uh, the tech, I'm gonna go ahead and run these older these ones that came with the amp in the transistor tester because I, I I imagine that these ones might be new as well and they were fitted by the tech, uh, although they are covered in thermal paste, so maybe not. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna test these ones and uh, see what their health status is like. Because I will need to reuse these, uh, potentially. I do have some 50N20s, but I've got a whole bunch of random ones laying around. Right, so we've got a VT, which is a, a, a turn-on voltage, a gate turn-on voltage of 4.3, and um, RDS of 0.7. All right, so we want the important one is to match up is the VT, the turn-on voltage. It's also important to kind of match up the RDS, but it's less actual specific. It's like less super fucking important. Um, it's still important, but you know, it's less of a mad issue with, with, with the amplifier just running. Um, so yeah, 4.3 is what we're going for with the VT. The gate capacitance needs to be somewhat similar as well. But okay, oh 4.8. Ah, I've got a fucking high RDS as well there, that's not good. Okay, so I, I, I can't use this one. This is a... 
What's that? What batch is that? That is a SS1236. Oh, fuck. I think it's the same batch. Yeah, right. So, uh, the one with the high RDS, uh, we won't want to be using. Yeah, so that one, this MOSFET, although it's still a MOSFET, it's probably damaged inside. Uh, got a pretty high RDS on that, and the VT has shifted. This one with the low RDS is probably fine. Uh, this one again got 3.6 on the RDS. That's too high. That one's probably would be damaged as well. And this last one, so we now don't have enough FETs. Uh, that's 2.0 again. That's that's not right. Okay, so I can't trust any of the FETs that did come with the board. Um, I do have a drawer here which does have some 200 volts. TO220 parts, which is what these are. So the FETs that we want to use need to be 50 amps or greater. So let's see what I have in here. Okay, so I have, I do have some 50N20. So I've got four 50N20s, uh, and I want to try and keep the batches the same in parallel banks. So I need to find three matching good 50N20Ps in this uh, box here and uh, then we should be able to load them up, provided they are similar VT to the new ones that we've got. Now these are all gonna be a whole mismatch of batches and these will have been salvaged from amplifiers where this the, the side of the amplifier containing these FETs wasn't damaged, but I decided to do a full refresh anyway. So using these FETs uh, shouldn't pose any risk. They are used FETs, but they haven't been subjected to um, any stress, otherwise they wouldn't be in this box. Um, I would have, I would have chucked them out if they, ha if I thought they had. So I've got a whole bunch of, there's, yeah, there's a whole bunch of 1520ps in here. I'm, I'm bound to have some that are going to work. Got some 50, got some 61 in twenties. That actually, uh, if I've got enough 61 in twenty, no, I can't use those. I need six of those if I'm going to do that. Um, Uh, just bear with me while I sort through these and just uh, grab grab some of these. Uh, 45, that's too low. 45 N, 31 N, that's too low. There's another 50 N, 20. 50 N, 20 again. 50 N, 20 again. 15, 20 again. All right, I think we've got enough there now. I should be able to. Uh, I should be able to find three that match. This three is all I need. That's a match with this. Another one there. Yeah. All right. Okay. That's that's pretty much all of them checked. So, out of all of these ones here that I put in a nice line, I need to find three that match. So the initial thing would be to uh, put matching batches together. These are all going to be different probably though because they've come from a variety of different amplifiers. So um, these two are the same batch. We've got an 829, that's a B27. Um, that is a 61. There we go. So we've got three here which are from the same batch. So that's a promising. Um, but they do need to match up match up kind of okay with the new ones I've got. That is a 13 batch, I don't have any more of those. That's a 540Z, that is a 27, that is a 32, that's a 27. Got two 27s, a 13, 32, two 32s, that's a 31. Alright, so the only ones that I've got three of, ah, I've got three uh, KB27s, and I've got three K829s. So I've got two rows here, of, uh, of FETs that are matching batches for the high side and low side. So what I want to do is I want to take one of these new ones and I want to see what the VT is of these FETs. Because if the v I need to match up the VT of these ones with the old ones. So 
So let's shove that in here. Okay, so the VT we've got on these is down at 4.0 volts, and the RDS is nice and low, 0.5. So we're looking for these batches to have between 3.8 and 4.2. I don't like going 0.2 of a volt either side. 4.1, okay, that's looking good. So we have a promising batch here. I'm just gonna check all three of these, make sure they're all similar. 4.8 and an RDS of 28. What the fuck? Okay, that is KO, that is fucked. Can't use that. Cannot use that. Bye bye. Okay, so that batch is no good. So fingers crossed then we're down to this last one. Okay, 4.4, 4. Uh, might have to roll with it, RDS of 0. 0.8. 4.6, RDS of 2, ah, fuck. I wonder whether, oh, actually, I wonder whether the, this, this transistor tester can measure these ones properly. So the RDS is fluctuating a little bit on these three. It's low-ish, but it's a bit high for my liking. I'm going to undo, I'm going to take out of the packet, where the fuck did I just, where did I put the rest of these, what the, did anybody, ah, found them, so I'm going to take the other four out of here, I'm just going to make sure that these brand new ones all have the same RDS, um, because if they don't have the same RDS, then it's more than likely just a problem with how the transistor tester is measuring these, and reading the RDS incorrectly, maybe. Because these ones I know, I know for a fact these FETs are good. I know that there's not going to be a problem with these ones. So if the RDS is all over the place on these new ones, then I just, I'm going to put it down to just a transistor tester issue. But if it's not, then, okay, so we've got 0.8. Point four. Well, that's a bit different. Slow though. Point four. Point seven. And are these all the same batch? We got uh, sixteen. Yeah, they're all the same batch. So we've got an RDS on the transistor tester, as far as this thing is concerned, of between point four and point eight of an ohm, which is low enough to be acceptable on this thing. It's not going to be the true RDS, because that's obviously super duper low, but having these ones with an RDS of 2.1 is not acceptable. And the VT is uh, is fluctuating too much as well. So as a result, I'm going to have to order uh, a fresh batch of six 50N20Ps for this amplifier, um, and I'll have to fit those another day. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that we can safely say that the amplifier is a successful repair because we did see the, uh, the square wave on the output section there and the current draw from the power supply was low. So I'm very confident to say that this was a successful repair even if we can't reassemble it and bench test it just yet, which is really, really annoying. But yeah, actually guys, what I'm going to do is I'm actually um, going to go ahead and... Um, take one little look in the box that this amplifier came in, just outside, uh, just in case there was another packet that fell off, um, because usually this guy includes all of the required parts to re re rebuild these amplifiers. So I'm just going to make sure there wasn't another couple of packets that fell off, and also get a soft drink, or maybe a beer, because I'm pretty thirsty. So I shall be back in just a minute. And I wonder, do I have a BRB? Do I have a BR? I, I did have a BRB. Nope. Okay, I used I didn't have a BRB. So just one sec, I'll be back.
Okay, so unfortunately there weren't any other sets that had fallen out in the uh, in the box, and also unfortunately I did I, I don't have any beer. I'm running out of beer, which is really freaking annoying. So no beer, no fets, no luck. But the good thing is we can move on to the next amplifier, which I'm going to be looking at this evening, which is going to be a good one. Um, it's a Hertz uh, bass mono amplifier. It does about two and a half k, I think. So let's put these back. Put our 2010 S's back. That was a success. I'll remove this board from the power supply. What's going on in the live chat? Talking about where we're from. Really love your videos. I'm getting a lot of knowledge from you. I'm really glad, man. That, uh, I'm happy when people say that they are learning stuff from what I'm doing. Because at the end of the day, like, I, I would just be doing this stuff anyway, like, on my, by myself. So if I can be doing this and also teaching people about amplifier repair at the same time, um, then that's like a win-win. Uh, it makes me happy. Because, uh, yeah, I think knowledge is the key. It's really good to learn shit. Uh, I also need some capacitors for that board as well so that board needs a fair few bits uh, to order in right next board John says I have a short going across my entire output section reading 22 ohms it was accidentally run at a low impedance than it was supposed to um, B entering bridge mode. Can you point me in the right direction? Uh, so, John, first of all, tell me what amplifier it is you've got, um, and then because if it's a class A B or a class D or or a class G H, uh, means different things. If you've got twenty two ohms on the output section, and also when you say you've got twenty two ohms on the output section, what do you, what are you measuring between? Are you measuring between the speaker terminals? Are you measuring between the MOSFET pads? Which MOSFET pads are you measuring between, etc.? All right, next amplifier then. Let's get that up on the bench, ready to go. Pa -pa -da -ba. All right then. So this is Hertz, Hertz HP-1D. Uh, these are actually superb amplifiers. Really, really nice amplifiers, these. Um, they're a bit of a bitch to take apart. So that's what we're going to get started with now. Uh, so in order to take this thing apart, we actually need to remove quite a few bits on here. Um, there's, a, there's a knob in here which needs to come off, first and foremost because otherwise the board doesn't come out. So you see this level knob here. You need to pull that off the potentiometer. It can, uh, it's actually very tight on there, so this is, I don't, these things are a bit of a nightmare to take apart. You need to get uh, something to pry it off with. There we are. This, uh, this metal uh, plate here is kind of loose. It's interesting. I'm going to get a, a bag ready for all the, all the uh, parts for this amplifier so we don't lose any bits. We can put the knob in there to start with. Ah, that's what she said. That's what she said. And now let's get cracking with the screws on the back. Now these are really, really nice amplifiers. Uh, this amplifier, the customer apparently shorted out the speaker uh, terminals. So we should probably have a hopefully simple output section repair on this one. Uh, I'm going to change the current amplifier before anyone said it. Oh my god! That's actually never happened before. That's never happened before. I remembered to change the current amp before anyone reminded me. Damn! What's it coming to? That's. Uh, uh, what is it again? HP1D. 
HP 1D. There we go. John said, I've, uh, ah, here we go. This is her back on uh, John's amplifier now. So he said, we've gone through a lot of videos, live streams that are on your playlist. I've got myself as far as learning to read the codes. And uh, it's the little tiny black ones. Uh, okay, cool. It is, it's a kicker. It's a, it's a, it's a kicker. Well, Google just uh, woke up then when I said that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a kicker ZR240. They're, they're, sound, they're pretty cool. I have a Hertz 15k monster SPL. It's a beast. Yes, hey, Volvo and Steph, I've actually got one of those in the workshop as well at the moment with a strange issue. Um, yeah, it's the, the great big Hertz thing that has the direct power leads that, that bolt on to the rails. Yeah, it's a pretty awesome amplifier. I've got one of those just, just literally sitting over there. Um, uh, I've got a... John says, um, on the outside pins of the MOSFETs, but none are reading zero. I've got a bunch of little tiny black PNP and NPN transistors. Um, one use 2H, one U. I've learned a lot from you in your live streams. That sounds like that might be the um, the drive transistors then for the output section. Um, I'll tell you what, John, actually send me a picture of the circuit board to my uh, Bearvids Facebook page. If, if you're on Facebook, just type in Bearvids in the search and I'll come up. Just send me a message and shoot me a picture of the board um, and I'll, I'll help you to locate what those transistors are for and um, maybe where the short is coming from. So the first thing obviously to do is remove all the FETs. If you've removed all the FETs and you've double checked you've got no solder bridges on the pads that you've just done your desoldering on. Uh, if you have uh, a 22 ohms between like the gate and the source on the outputs then it's probably the, the, uh, the drive transistors are probably shorted check across the drive transistors. Yep, if you still get it, then remove the drive transistors, making notes of which ones went where. Um, if you uh, Then check for the short again, and if you still have the short after you've removed the drive transistors, then check like some diodes. So the components that are gonna fail on amplifiers uh, that don't show a visual sign of failure, like a burned resistor, is gonna be diodes, like semiconductor parts, diodes, MOSFETs, voltage regulators, and capacitors, small capacitors. So generally, if you're having a bit of a stuck moment and you're like, I don't, know, I don't know where the fuck's this short's coming from, just go blind for a minute. Just take your multimeter and just start measuring random diodes and capacitors and stuff on the board. And you might actually find one that is shorted. Sometimes it's good just to step back and stop, don't think too deep about it. And just start measuring like diodes and shit, stuff that shouldn't be shorted. Uh, just start measuring it and see, see what it reads as. This amplifier, I've I, I, I've worked on this one like three times before. <laughs> oh, no, for fuck's sakes! Right. The reason that I am so pissed off right now that this amplifier has come in is this amplifier was butchered before by uh, a guy a guy called Louis. <laughs> and I, I actually made a very difficult repair um, to this amplifier um, because the, uh, the driver board location pads were so badly damaged I had to really work, uh, use all, all my skill and all my knowledge to make a solid repair of this amplifier and um, the customer has shorted out the speaker terminals thus killing the alpha MOSFETs and to, for me to try and take the driver board out now, that's just that's just going to be a f freaking headache. Uh, 
Uh, why? Why you do this? Okay. Right, I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope and pray that the drive circuit is all right. It's probably not gonna be, knowing my luck. But you never know. So I'm gonna hope and pray that maybe the drive circuit in this is all right. So we're gonna remove our shorted MOSFETs first. And then we're going to test the drive circuit. That's the first thing we're gonna do. All right, where's my head cam? So you can see what I'm doing. Uh, Volvo Steph, the issue appears uh, when you when you first power it up, um, it makes it, it clips really early. So the first powers up, the rail voltage is built to where they should do, but the audio signal it clips. Uh, the signal going into the drive circuit isn't clipped, but it's clipped when it comes out and goes to the FETs. Um, but as the amplifier stays on for longer, once you've been running it for five ten minutes, the issue gradually goes away and then it plays at full power. Um, so it's a really weird drive circuit related fault. I don't know. I, I, honestly, I am dreading working on it because it's such a dangerous amplifier to work on. The rail voltages are so fucking high and it, I can cause hundreds of pounds worth of damage if I slip my probe. I'm not looking forward to working on that bad boy. I might actually, um, the driver boards are on headers and you can pull them out. So what I might be tempted to say is actually just go ahead and get some, try and source some new driver boards for it, whatever it costs, because I'm not happy to start pulling around with the original driver boards. I just want to drop some new ones in and see if that fixes it. The weird thing is, is that obviously the amp, the 15K is a two channel. Okay, it's a, it's a two channel, it's, it works in bridge mode. Um, so there are two identical amplifiers inside the case and both of the channels do the same issue. So, mm, it, it must be something, so if it's not on the driver boards, if the, both driver boards haven't got the same issue, it must be something on the output of the, so on the, each amplifier's MOSFET output, it must be something on the, on the filter circuit or the smoothing circuit after the inductor that causes a problem, but I don't know. I haven't looked at it properly yet. <coughs> Raquel says I've got a uh, PPI Black Eyes Class AB work on it. Uh, it's working, but only two channels. The other two channels are not working. Is it the output IC is gone, and what else do I have to check? Uh, if it's a, if it's a Class AB, it probably hasn't got output ICs. It probably just has a discrete um, drive circuit made up of transistors. Um, if the channels are straight up not working, then it's more than likely that the signal is not actually getting to the drive circuit. On these old um, Class AB amplifiers, the majority of the reason that channels don't work is because the switches and the knobs and the potentiometers on the preamp section, they get really corroded and crap and they get dirt and dust in them. And you can fix it usually by spraying some contact cleaner or isopropyl alcohol in the switches and everything on the preamp section or all the settings that you make. And you toggle the switches backwards and forwards like a hundred times and you, you spray it all on the, uh, on the potentiometers and you twist them up and down loads of times to clean all those contacts and switches and potentiometers up. And most of the time, that's the problem. If that doesn't fix it, then you want to be looking for bad solder joints, cracked solder joints on the RCAs or on headers from the preamp circuit down to the main amplifier circuit. If that doesn't solve it, then you want to be taking your oscilloscope out and following, trying to trace and follow the audio signal through the amplifier to see where it loses the audio audio signal. Okay, let's get started with this, uh, this uh, Hertz then. So the guy said that uh, he shorted the output terminals. So we are probably going to have shorted output MOSFETs. So let's just check that with our multimeter here. Okay, so this first batch. Uh, we don't have a short between drain, uh, gate and source, which is good, and there's no short... Uh oh, okay, so there's a short between drain and source. However, because the gate is okay on this MOSFET bank, I'm going to go ahead and take a guess and say that it's actually the ones on the, on the other side of the board that are bad. 
Yeah, so we've got a, a short between drain and source on all these four, but I think these fets are probably okay. It's probably these ones that are bad. Ah, interesting. There's no short to gate on this one either. Ah, ah here we are. Okay, so there's a short on the gates of this set over here. Right, I think, guys, we might actually get away with... We might actually just have one dead fet in this thing. One or two dead fets. Because when, uh, when the speaker... Right, so basically, when someone shorts out the speaker terminals, yeah, or the amplifier, obviously uh, it, it, an immense current surge is, is sent through the output section. Um, some of the FETs will deal with it and some of them won't. Now, these FETs will all have very slightly different resistances, RDS. Um, and the ones that have the lowest RDS are the ones that will die in a short circuit situation on the speaker terminals. So if there's any differences in RDS between these FETs, the ones with the lowest RDS will die in a short circuit scenario. So, because of that phenomenon, we might get away with actually just having a, a, a small one or two output MOSFETs that died here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to wibble and, and snap this one off. So that should get rid of the short circuit and it should be on the FET. Yep, so we have a shorted FET there with uh, continuity, so that one's dead. And this uses 69N25s. I love 69N25s. So if I now go ahead and probe the board, the short circuit on the board has disappeared. However, has the short circuit between drain and source disappeared? Uh, yes, it has. We don't have a short circuit between drain and source anymore on that side. Let's check over this side. Uh-oh. We still have a short circuit between drain and source on this side of the board, however. So one of one or more of these FETs over this side is probably going to be dead. Or maybe this side. So in order to see, to, to try and guess which FET is dead over on the, on the rest of them over here, we don't have any shorts to gate by the looks of it, but we will have a difference in, in value on the multimeter. So if I put my multimeter here so you can see, I'm going to make my scope screen smaller so you can see what I'm doing here and the numbers on the multimeter. So the FET that's dead is going to have uh, inconsistency on the gate between the gate and either the source or the gate and drain. So I'm going to start measuring some of these and see what numbers we come up with between the gate. So we've got 1445 on this one between the uh, gate and the drain. I'm going to flip my probes around and test it again. Okay, that's the sort of number we're looking for. So 570 on this one. Let's go along to the next one. Again, 570. So that's uh, looking pretty good. Let's go over to the other side of the board. Ah, 554. Mm -mm. And 561. So I'm going to go ahead and bet that this one with the lower number is probably the dead one. Let's try gate to source instead. We've got 554. Oh, it's going to be the same because these, these legs are shorted anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and take a guess that it's this one that's shorted out because it has the lowest resistance number on those two. I'm actually going to take my, my multimeter off of diode setting. I'm going to put it onto just straight resistance setting and see if that uh, shows up any differences here. Two four nine eleven ten ninety four. Yeah, I think it might be this one. If it's not, then that sucks because I've just uh, wasted a, a fairly decent fit. Has the short disappeared? <laughs> yeah, it has. 
There we are, lads. My 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 guessing game was was right. Where where did I just put it? Where where did I put it? I want to I want to test it. I, I, oh, fuck's sake! I put it down. Where, where the fuck did I put it? I oh, hear it is right. I think this is on. There we go. Yep, Boomtown. That's happy days. Sweet. So that was a good guess. So so far, two definite definite dead fets. So the rest of them might have survived, and they might have been damaged. So um, because I want to try and do this as a quick repair, and I really. I really want to avoid taking this amplifier out of the case because of how many times it's been in and out of the case. Um, just, yeah, a whole bunch of reasons I don't want to take this thing out of the case again. Uh, one, one of the reasons is because this driver, this board here, to get this out, obviously the driver board's in the way. Oh, it's fucking, no, no. I'm going to try and do a top board repair on this. So if there are only two FETs here that have died, um, then I am, oh, fuck, I'm tempted to maybe just replace all of them anyway, I've got enough 69 and 25s to replace all of them, so I might, even though these ones read okay, I might just replace all of them, but I can use these FETs that are left in the board to um, power the amplifier up and see if the drive circuit survived anyway. So let's put the, uh, let's put some power wires into the board, and um, Let's start to slowly power her up and see if the rail voltages are where they're supposed to be. And then see if we get any switching or any exploding FETs. But first, let's have a cheeky vape. Yep, that's what it looks like when the amplifier dies. It does look pretty cool. So I'm only going to allow about four amps to pass into this amplifier at the moment. I'm uh, going to plug our wires in, in the temporary positions, in the low current positions, easy to whip out when we, if we're working on the board. And we're going to shove our remote in there. Happy days. Uh, the remote isn't really in there properly. I'm probably going to have to unscrew the remote. Someone really screwed down that remote. Um, that remote uh, screw. <coughs> Let's have a look at the live chat real quick. Uh, Ah, I caught you live. Maybe I can learn something. It was a pleasure to watch. Ah, yes. Well, hopefully you're in for a nice treat with this amplifier. I mean, I really I have my fingers crossed that this amplifier doesn't have any major faults because it's going to be a massive headache for me if it does and not necessarily a good live stream for you because uh, a lot of the actually it will be very time consuming and it will just be disassembly, which won't be fun for you guys. So I hope that this is a simple one. Um, John says, thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you, your videos, and your willingness to help uh, the less intelligent. I, I wouldn't say less intelligent. That's uh, not the right uh, term. Just, uh, just, uh, you know, just haven't had the experience in it. So um, two years ago, or probably two, probably two and a half years ago, I barely even knew what a he what the fuck a MOSFET was. Honestly, two and a half years ago, I had not a single clue how to do any sort of amplifier repair whatsoever. I opened the back of an amplifier, and I looked inside, and I was like, what the fuck, I have no idea what's going on in here. It just looks like a mess of spaghetti, and like, no idea. 
So, um, yeah, it's definitely possible to come a long way if you're dedicated and you do your research and stuff. Um, again, I've not had any classes, electronics classes or courses or anything. All, everything that I know about how to repair these is literally just from trial and error, giving it a go, hands-on, seeing what works, making mistakes, learning from them. Um, so it's definitely possible to, to get good or get okay, you know, get, get reasonable at repairing these things in not too much time if you're dedicated enough. Uh, it's, uh, it's like defusing a bomb, yeah, definitely. I have a pair of audio, audio, oh, audio Q, audio Q back in the day. Ah, oh, the AQ20, fuck, that needs work. Uh, no, so Volvo Steph, yeah, that's gonna be a, uh, interesting. Nice, dangerous, high rail voltages in the nose. Good luck with that. But yeah, the AQ20 is a massive beast of an amplifier, really, really good. I have a SCAR SK3500, and when the amp comes on with no speakers or RCA hookup, it makes a loud, high-pitched noise, but it plays fine. So JC Extreme Audio, that's not a problem. Uh, the thing that causes the high-pitched whine is actually coming from the tr uh, power supply transformers. So what is happening is there is a tiny, tiny amount of uh, lead vibration, or, or like a, it's, it's a transformer whine, so basically, um, what's happening is that the transformers are a little bit loose or there's a, a tiny little loose lead that is just vibrating enough uh, at a very high frequency like you know uh, 16 kilohertz or 12 kilohertz very very fast very high frequency because obviously the transformer is uh, being pushed pulled back and forth and so um, the magnetic fields that are generated are pushing and pulling and affecting one lead a tiny bit so the way to resolve that is to take the back off the amplifier power it up on a very low current supply so it's safe and with it powered up and making the high pitched noise just grab the transformers and give them a wiggle see which one it is that's making the high pitched whine noise and um, then you'll notice that the high pitched whine either goes away it gets worse or changes when you wiggle around and move the transformers and so you want to try and kind of move it into a position where it isn't giving the whine and then you can add some uh, CA glue or some mastic or some kind of silicon sealant uh, to lock to